Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of the Cathode Ray Podcast. I'm joined by my friend Steve Nutter. How are you doing, Steve? Wonderful. I'm uh, very happy to have two Australian handsome gentlemen <laughs> here with me. <laughs> it is. It's international diplomatic relations here. So today on the show, we've got Dan Mons on. You may know Dan from his recent work and ongoing work with the Retro NAS project, which has been getting a bit of coverage recently. So we wanted to have Dan on. We're going to talk a little bit about Retro NAS, but mostly around the experiences that Steve and I have had uh, setting up the software. We've both set it up ourselves. Um, if you want that really deep dive on Retro NAS, uh, Bob from Retro RGB did an excellent real deep dive uh, going all the way through the protocols and all the possibilities for the future and really uh, getting into the nitty gritty. Uh, you can look at the Retro RGB channel for that. We'll just do a little bit on Retro NAS today. And we know Dan uh, has interests and skills in many different fields in retro computing. We want to look at his work at uh, he, uh, CRT calibration, uh, his love for CRTs, a little bit about old microcomputers from back in the day in Australia. There's a lot of extra interesting things to nerd out and geek out about. Dan, how you doing today, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks for uh, having me, guys. It was really nice. Oh, happy to be there. God, so there's so, so uh, we're going to presume people know a little bit about the retro NAS, uh, where it's at, uh, where to go. Steve, you set one up. What were some of yeah, your thoughts yeah, I from, set one up. from setting one up? Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I'll give a little bit of my, um, how, I, how I actually even got into the project and everything. So what originally happened is when Bob came to, um, came to drop a bunch of junk off, and drink all my beer. <laughs> he, uh, I was talking with him, and I was like, "Hey, um, I've, I mean, I'm like, I've never really set up like a, a network server kind of thing." And he's like, "Oh man, no, I, I can't really tell you anything just yet because I mean, I can't." It was early December. He's like, "But I'm working on something right now, and uh, and you're gonna love it." And I was like, "Okay, great." And then I and I realized when he started getting giddy on the. Uh, when we got the Patreon early access to him talking about the retro NAS, but it wasn't even that actually. Um, I saw, I, I'm subscribed to your channel, Dan, and I first saw you, you started popping up all your tutorials and I was like, wait a second, what's going on? <laughs> Cause that came, yeah. I think before Bob's did. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean the, like I really wanted to have documentation. Like that was the big one. And, and I think I was sort of talking to you just before, like, um, it's difficult stuff. Like not everybody's got networks at home that are complex or if they if they do have a network at home, it's really something, you know, they've just got their ISP router in the corner and a couple of cables and, and you know, hopes and dreams and that's about it. So, you know, it's it's tough for people to set this stuff up. So the whole the whole desire of RetroNAS to start with was to try and simplify the process. And like I've been mates with Bob for a while and, and one of the things he's always banging on my head about, because like I'm, I'm a – Linux guy, right? Like that's my trade for work as well as just for nerd stuff that I do at home. So it's, it's I've been in a command line since I was born, literally, right? Like that was, you know, um, the only way I've experienced computers for, for 40 odd years now. So uh, it, to me, it's really intuitive. To other people, it's really difficult. Bob hates Linux, like hates, hates, hates <laughs> Linux. Like it just makes him angry and he, he gets sweary and yeah he just hates it so it's he's always in my ear sort of saying Dan you've got to make this stuff easier you've got to make this stuff easier so before I even started like retro NAS was as much as I like I'm a rubbish coder right like I'll, I'll put my hand on my heart I'm really terrible at coding thankfully I've got another person um, Cyric who's come on board for retro NAS now and he's helping out with like bringing the coding quality up. Uh, there's another guy who's come on board who wants to put a web GUI on it, which is like great, amazing. Like that's the kind of stuff I can't do. So I'm, if someone wants to do that, please, you know, help. But I guess for me, like part of what I do at work as well is there's a lot of training stuff that I have to do, um, specifically training people in Linux. So, you know, that whole like gentle, softly voice, nice, uh, you know, intro video, nice and slow on the command line, like that kind of stuff is is pretty normal and natural for me. So before I even started, I want to get those videos up. Um, and yeah, I kind of had them all sitting private off to the side. And then one day I just kind of went, ah, stuff it. I'll just hit the, hit the public button, whatever. Uh, and they all kind of jammed up there and there's, yeah, there's a few confused people sort of like, what is going on? And then, yeah, it all kind of snowballed once videos, uh, Bob's video came out. Yeah, I that's, like, um, that's exactly what happened to me. Yeah, go ahead, Lewis. 
I was going to say, I just like, I, I wanted to say to you, Dan, that I like your tutorial videos. I like the pace. You don't try and cut them. You don't speed them up. Um, I installed RetroNAS in a VM and I had to install Debian from scratch. I kind of know it enough, but nevertheless, I just, I could follow along. It was like programming with Dan or IT with Dan. And it was like <laughs> following along and I could do it too. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's a great pace you have awesome. rather than most YouTubers are sort of cut, 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 snappy, snappy. Oh yeah, try to make it. Inter inter added their personal entertainment or something yeah. to it. It's I like your really style. Kind of so I yeah, came from a training either. background. Yeah, well, cheers. I mean, like, yeah, I, I'm the same. I find YouTube videos are either way too fast and you're kind of, you're constantly pausing and trying to catch up or they're too slow. It's just like, this could be five bullet points. Don't, you know, they're stretching it out to the 10 minute mark or whatever to try and get the thumbs up. So, um, like, I just... I don't care about any of the, the likes and updates, right? It was just about getting the documentation out there. I might even try and get it out on other platforms, so, you know, in case YouTube ever has a fit and wants to delete things. So, um, But, yeah, definitely, like, getting the pacing right. I know as an Australian I get told I speak quickly <laughs> and I have to slow down a lot, so there's a lot of, like, just pulling it back, trying to not to, you know, not to let the the uh the nasal voice and the, <laughs> and <laughs> the I, fast talking ruin everything up, yeah exactly yeah, up, yeah. Just, <laughs> something on something on the videos <laughs> like the funny thing is i'll be i was watching some of these uh videos i mean like loads of them on yours like once i got so the first thing basically the first thing i did is once bob released his guide i was like well okay but if, like like you said i've never I, i'm barely any experience with Linux, like personally. And that's, uh, I understand, doesn't, I mean. That's normal. It, yeah. It, yeah, but <laughs> and, like the only thing like I've had close would have been my setting up of my Mr. Cade kind of um, is, is, is the first experience. And I had a hell of a time with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the same thing mm -hmm. with like Mr. Add-Odds. I was like bugging him and he's like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's okay. But um, with when I went through and I was like, I, I watched Bob's intro and then I was like, holy crap, I have a uh, Retro Pi 3 just sitting in the closet back here. And it was from this, it's called a, a kit, like a kid's computer kit. And it was something my son yeah, yeah, got one. Yeah. from my grand, like his grandparents two or three years ago now for Christmas. And we pulled it out and he played code on it for a little bit and like put it together in a little case. And then it, I just put it back in the box because he eventually got like an iPad and didn't care. And uh, so, which is funny, but that's like, uh, but that's basically what happened. And he, so I, I was like, well, I'll just use this. So I pulled that out and I found an extra four terabyte hard drive that I had here. And I was like, well, let's do it. And I went through that guide and like, um, it went really well. Like everything felt well until like I ran into my first hiccup and, uh, I think that that's if you're if you're trying this. The, the funny thing is, is like I was talking with Dan. Everything um, like my setup's obviously different from Dan's. Obviously different from Lewis's. I'm using this Raspberry Pi three thing. Uh, that but that's the awesome thing about this project is, I did, to get that part started. I didn't actually have to invest anything besides time, and um, and you had done and Bob both. Like the documentation was so well at the beginning. Where it's just like I said, like it's not just like you get Bob's teaser video and then you had to wait, right, to get all this documentation. You already had your page up. You already had a playlist of good tutorials on each one of these lines in this uh, in this whole setup. So, anyway, you know, after after I finally got it figured out and got the NAS set up and had files onto it, uh, I realized that all my other stuff, nothing's hooked up in my house, like besides the stuff on my Wi-Fi, right? Because that's pretty typical for Americans to have yeah, yeah. just their yep. Wi-Fi. And uh, my Wi-Fi company is a fiber company. So I was like, I know I have fast internet and they give me these little dongles or things that are around the house, two of them. And they either emit uh, Wi-Fi or they have two uh, high speed prongs in them for ethernet cables so i was laughing with lewis after that i had to build or try to estimate the distance from my computer over here which is like back to that monitor behind my head is <laughs> that's like 40 feet along the wall and then my mr kate is all the way at the other cape corner so i was like network labeling laying cable you know all this stuff um so 
it turned into a way big project, but I absolutely like love it now. I don't want to sit here and just talk like for 20 minutes because I do plan on doing a short video just showing my setup and kind of talking about how I got there um, as more of like a inspirational piece to get people, if they're feeling like they want to do this, to give it a shot. Yeah, and I mean, like that was kind of the the goal of the whole project, right? Like it was. Um, like I've, I've had a NAS in my house forever because I mean that's what I do for a living, <laughs> so it's, it was kind of just normal for me. And and it's you know it, it's uh, photo backups and video backups and and you know personal documents, and then that syncs to the cloud and blah 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 blah. So that's all like normal stuff for me. And when I talk to other people about it, they're like, "Oh, I wish I had that kind of stuff. That'd be cool." And it's like, "Well, it's easy. Just you know, Linux this and command like that, mm -hmm. and then the anger starts." So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, this this whole thing was really just like, "No, you can do it too. Look, just get this little, you know, whatever, thirty five, forty dollar computer and do X, Y, Z." And I think um, the part shortages suck. Like that's the big one. This thing kind of dropped right in the middle of nobody can get a Raspberry Pi. So that kind of pushed me to go, "Okay, I've got to, I've got to be." bigger than a Raspberry Pi. I've got to look at other stuff. So the VMs and the, you know, junker computers and that kind of stuff sort of uh, spiraled out of there as well. Most, and it, you know, I'll gush about Linux here because Linux can run on anything. Um, that's kind of what drove it to try and be a bit broader. So still got a lot of work to do. People want things like Docker containers and, you know, QNAP and Synology devices supported and all that kind of stuff. And, it, and it's, all, it's all on the wish list. Um, it's just a matter of finding the time to do it because the thing has quite unexpectedly kind of blown up um, and I've just I've spent so many hours just helping folks out, building new modules that people want, trying to bug fix, all that kind of stuff, which is cool. Like I, I love it and I love doing it. Um, it's just it's really hard to juggle the huge, you know, like request list that's come out of this, that's all. But uh, otherwise, yeah, it's, it's been, been rewarding, I guess, to see people have a go. Um, just have a go get a get a box or a raspberry pi or something bang it in and have a go at home networking and you know like 99 percent of people are successful so that's really well just to say like i know that um of course that was one of the things i was concerned about and then i was like oh this is so awesome once see that was the thing i always i knew that if i could sit here and bang my head against the wall long enough with linux and go through through, through your tutorials multiple multiple times <laughs> like all right i did something wrong i just slow down do it again do it again do it again uh i knew that that was going to be invaluable information because i'm like wow look at how much stuff you actually can do with these pi computers around the house and um thankfully there is like somebody just launched a pi locator website and i bought mm. two pies yep. this week one from a one from a, a Chinese company and one from a company in the UK, and they both shipped. And uh, one is a Raspberry Pi 4 CM, which I'm really excited about seeing that. Um, I, you know, that was like first after doing this, I learned about that, and then I got another all in one module. But um, yeah, I, I was just super pumped to be able to use that. And the idea, too, that I mean, that's what I like that Lewis was like, oh, I'll do this too. And he used a completely different um, way of setting it up. Did, did, yeah, I mean, you said that, right? It's something that I, I want to talk a little bit more about. I mean, you know, I'm thinking about videos or the future. Um, right. You, I watched Dan's how to put it in a virtual box. I knew V, I understood VMware a little bit better, so I use that same same. And I think there's a great use case there because Steve and I have very opposite circumstance. Look at that beautiful room that he's got there. He's got so <laughs> much room. It's a place he can make, he can lay things out and have things under his TV. I got nothing. I got a little cave here um, and one shared lounge room that I can't, you know, my girlfriend is understanding. <laughs> However, it's the main lounge room and we all know we can't add too much junk out there. So I'm into uh, small setups. I'm into setups that can be teared down and, and put together quickly. And I see a retro NAS in a VM as really something very useful for that because <laughs> it's like a tool for me. If I need the PS2, <laughs> gee, yeah, I could fire it up, run off PS2. If I just need to access this weird computer via SMB1 for some reason, I can fire it up uh, very quickly, have it up, do it. If I don't have room for another device, but it, when I use it, I could, I'm just going to leave that VMware image there now. And whenever I need to, I've already had the VMware image serving to a real PS2 worked, no problems. And just even that, just that has annoyed me for years, setting up SMB1 on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, even that alone is brilliant. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility there and I'm, I'm happy about this project. 
Yeah, cool. I, I mean, that was a use case as well. Like there was a lot of people in your boat that, you know, I've got mates who, who live in tiny apartments in the city and they said the same thing. Like I don't, I don't want to set up all this gear. I don't want even a NAS, right? It was way too much, too noisy, spinning discs mm. and fans and blah, blah, blah. I don't want that in my house. I've got this like super silent, you know, M1 super duper whiz bang MacBook and I want just something off that. Can you make a blah, blah, blah? So I was like, yeah, well, you can bang a virtual machine on that. Um, you know, most most things will work off uh, fast Wi-Fi for the modernish stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for the older stuff, you know, wide is better. But yeah, I mean, you can get USB Ethernet dongles for like what ten bucks or something, right? So that kind of suits that need as well. So yeah, trying to definitely trying to cover as many people as possible. Um, and on zero dollars, that was my yeah. big want. I wanted people to spend nothing to make this work. Yeah. Uh, this well, this yeah, setup that I had, so um, awesome. the the VMware server is on my. I would say I think it's like a seven-year-old, eight-year-old Mac. It's very old. It's not even support. Doesn't get the Monterey, um, and it's coming off Wi-Fi as well. And it served uh, served up a PS2 game exactly fine. So even a little bit. I mean, we're all going crazy for networking. Steve and I talked about that in the last episode. <laughs> uh, we love. We all well, got you, into networking. You, so but. you ran your games wirelessly. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Uh, the, 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 the retro wow. NAS was running off a my wireless MacBook. It's not physically Ethernet plugged in. And fine. I played some games. Uh, no problem. So maybe even a 10 100. That's a 10 100. Oh, I don't know. Anyway, that uh, it's the 5G. I get confused on Wi Fi things. It's 5G. Yeah. That's better. The fi- 5 gigahertz. The yeah. 5 giga, 5 gigahertz. Yeah, yeah. Not 5G. Too much Bill Gates. Talk. Wow. Yeah. So if you've, if you've, if you've got what they call Wi-Fi 5, which is the 802.11ac standard, um, that's not too bad. That can almost keep up with like probably 100 megabits, so mm-hmm. PlayStation 2 kind of stuff, assuming you are close enough. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the big killers with Wi-Fi is not so much the speed, it's the latency. So when packets drop um, and it's got to retry, um, and so when you're like when you're internet browsing, who cares, right? You if it's streaming video, you just buffer stuff, um, and if it's downloads and things, you don't notice. You just you, it's okay if you get like a big chunk of data and then have to wait, a, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred milliseconds, and then a big chunk of data and wait, and a big chunk of data and wait. That's cool. Um, when you uh, a PlayStation Two, and you think about it, right? Like they, these developers have got nothing to work with inside these consoles i was talking to extremes the guy who does the or one of the team who do swiss the mm. gamecube boot so we we released that today plug 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 mm. um so yeah so game gamecube's now um booting uh games over ethernet and extremes told me he had nine kilobytes of ram to fit everything in Right, nine kilobytes. So that's like network stack, client server, all the the Swiss hackery, all that. Right, you know, and it's like, man, I, I can't write an email less than nine <laughs> kilobytes. Right, like it, it's just it's yeah. just crazy it's like how little space this dude's got. Than. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Mm. Um, so anyway, yeah, it was it was just mad. So you you can see that you know they don't have the room for like advanced networking. So the latency is the big one, right? Like it's got to be able to go out to the server and go, I want this bit of stuff now and it's got to get it now. So definitely latency is the killer. If you, you can use Wi-Fi for these things, just be close, don't have a lot of noise. If, if you're like one of Bob's things was, you know, he lived in New York in, in the city and for him, Wi-Fi sucked because everybody around him has got Wi-Fi too. Every apartment, you know, mm. in, in three dimensions around him is just blasting his apartment with Wi-Fi noise. So his quality of Wi-Fi, he might have had good bandwidth, but his latency was just dying on him. So wide, absolutely a must for him. Um, I'm pretty fortunate to be in Australia. We've got low population density, even in cities. Um, I'm out in the burbs, but still, you know, like whatever, six kilometers, whatever that is in in your units i, I have to i can't remember where i'm <laughs> yeah, going bigger or it's smaller okay. smaller like four miles I, four miles yeah uh from the city so but even then like i'm i'm in pretty uh low density living so you know i can't reach out and touch my neighbors um so wi-fi is pretty good here um i haven't done a lot of testing on wi-fi though i've got a separate wi-fi network for my i've got three games rooms so this is games room number one that i'm in now um number two is over there which i'm not going to show you because it's a pigsty uh which is my arcade room and then number three is over there which is my uh pc computing room this is the console room <laughs> that's awesome um yeah so there's, there's like giant to the console CRT there. room shall we giant yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty <laughs> pretty much come on kids it's time so to go a- learn about basic for a while <laughs> 
<laughs> Pretty much, yeah. My kids have got a well-rounded education as long as it's about 1980s computers. So. Yeah. No, that's great. That's what uh, uh, so I was laughing. Some, I was uh, like, man, my kids never, like one day they might, like, now it's it's just like, oh, this is cool. We'll just have games. Oh, you want to come play games and stuff. But I was like, one day they maybe they'll look back and think this is really cool because when I was growing up, like I, I had just a one crappy console and it was like, never get to go get mm. anything new. And I'd get, I remember like being disappointed when I pick a bad video game, like I save up yep. my cutting grass to go rent a game from the game store and you get stuck with something and then the video game would suck and your weekend would just be like demolished <laughs> with disappointment. Yep. yep. Cause you're not, you're not getting enough money for another one for another, what, six months or something, yeah. right? Like between chores and birthday money or something. Yeah. yeah. That was, I think, trying to explain that to my kids. So, my, I think my kids are a bit older than yours, Steve. Mine are, mine are teenagers now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mine are still and yeah, try, young. trying, Yeah, trying to explain to them that when I was their age, I didn't have access to 3,000 video games, right? That, and they're like, what? What do you mean? That's not, doesn't make any sense. So, or the internet, yeah. right? Like the whole the world without internet to them is just, freaky so yeah it's, it's difficult to explain uh how hard it was to have fun yeah well the, the only way the funny thing is is the best way i relate the generations and the generational gap with my kids is when we go visit like my parents or my wife's parents and they turn on the terrestrial television and you have to sit there <laughs> in america you have to every 10 minutes they're going to play five minutes worth of advertisements and then, so that's the whole time it's like, what the heck is up with all these ads? <laughs> yeah. You know, because they're used to being like five seconds, 15 seconds. Mm-hmm. And that's all the time the advertisers have to get their message across. And then I just get on, I'm like, yeah, can you believe it? This is what it was always like. Can you believe your grandparents still pay money for this crap? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> they pay money to be sold. So they just laugh. That's like one yeah, of the yeah. best ways to relate still where it's going on. But, it's definitely something that, um, I mean, but there'll be something when their kids are older, I guess, if they have kids that they'll be doing the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah, I reckon uh, I reckon for my kids, it'll be VR. Like their kids will be just plugged into whatever, you know, goggles on 24 by 7. And my kids as parents will be like, back in my day, <laughs> we had to actually reach out and touch physical things, right? That's going to be the next, <laughs> the next thing. Good to get your hands dirty. Mm. yep yep yeah well uh like the the uh just i guess we could probably transition here shortly Mm -hmm. i don't know if there's anything else i mean that's really cool i did see do some gamecube testing i guess one last thing to just mention is again um to anybody out there if you're thinking about this project go read up there's a lot of stuff you can read still on dan's github and um familiarize yourself with things get everything all your boxes kind of checked and then the tutorials again are great because they they literally will walk you all the way through both bob's and dan's Um, just one funny thing on dan's he will sit there and let the code like the code run on linux yeah and i'm like did i pause the video or something because it's like silent for like 30 (laughs) seconds i'm like oh no there it's it's doing something (laughs) but yeah, I was when I edited those. I was like, "Do I cut?" Because I I don't want to like because if if it's too quick, people are going to be like, "Mine's slow. Right. There's something wrong with mine. It's crashed." Right? And I was like, "What do I do?" And I, like, I don't I don't know. Do I put music in there? I don't want to get copyright <laughs> strike. So I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I'll yeah. just sit in silence. No, I don't care. The right care. thing to do. <laughs> I think it was the right thing to do. It was actually cool because I was like, okay, let me see. Because then you could actually pause it and like, say, oh, is this oh, okay? Mine's doing the same kind of thing. Um, yeah, I yeah. I will tell people like. I mean, they're they're boring, but that's well, the point, that's right? a, it's your informational and helpful, you know, tutorial yep. style. And what, um, like. I, I knew that this was the issue. I was telling this to Dan before we got on uh, and started recording that my, I knew deep down that my issues were involving the personal network setup and like it, within my setup, I had a lot of trouble with just the standards uh, Windows settings within Windows itself, trying to, you know, go over and look at my re- and make my retro SMB uh, visible on my network. It involved my main net computer in the Windows settings. So, um, yeah, don't, uh, but D- Dan has sacrificed a lot of his time and, um, definitely, uh, f- 
other other <laughs> what are we trying to say here you spend a lot of free time my sanity and your, yeah. yeah your sanity <laughs> but like his you know his family looks at him and feels the effects of him sitting there right and so it's like yeah a little bit he's, yeah he's remember he's doing this out of the kindness of his heart and the goodness to help us all so um if you're having network issues it's okay and it's probably going to happen but just remember that um, a lot of this stuff is because of the other devices. Again, your Windows computer, I guess for some reason they don't probably, they're like, well, we have some something we want to sell you that will do this for you <laughs> instead of, you know, having Dan's free setup. So um, just remember that, yeah, sometimes you just, you might have to go back and try to find somebody else's tutorials on how to properly set up your network. And it's one of the things we're actually asking for. I threw a thing out on Twitter today. Um, is is that sort of stuff the client side config, and not just for the new stuff, but for the old stuff too, right? So we support heaps of old like MS DOS, Windows ninety five, uh, Windows three point one stuff is coming pretty soon. Uh, we've got some uh, dial up modem stuff coming soon. Amiga, Commodore sixty four. Um, we just put some support in for ZX Spectrum, old Unix System 5, uh, Atari 8-bit, like it's just a huge list of stuff that we support. And so what's missing now is the client-side stuff. So if people want to do videos where they set up stuff to talk to RetroNAS and then like tag us on Twitter or put a thing in GitHub or something, we'll link to those in, in the um, documentation and that'll be really valuable um, if people want to contribute those, that's that's cool because then it, it's that kind of stuff where it's like all these different computers and all these different people using different things. That's the bit we can't do because I don't have like infinity computers here, unfortunately. Right. I wish I did. It, and like with my specific, that's what I was like. I was like with my specific situation, it was strange because I literally did everything and everything was like 99% there. And it was just this one and it was literally just a, a little checkbox in Windows settings and it like was the key to unlocking the final door to get everything to work because I it was it was obviously like I could find the network it was sitting there and then I could do things and it like I got it to connect to the PlayStation once and then it was like well where's the um, every time I try to relog in it would give me this error and I was like some it's just got to be this and I knew it was something because I got on there and I could never like hit my network and refresh it and it never showed the SMB retro SMB it would only show it if I typed in the com in the Windows line the IP address and then I was like so I'm kind of getting there but it's not you know right and then of course at the same time right, I'm Steve, talking Steve, to Lewis Steve, I'm like Lewis CRT's, I'm gonna crash this I'm gonna crash this <laughs> Steve, 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 let's talk about CRTs. We're yeah. here to talk about CRTs. Oh, no, 27 we wanna, minutes. We want to talk about CRTs. Let's, talk about CRTs. <laughs> <laughs> let's go into that so, yeah. one. Let's go into that. Dan, let's talk. Yeah. Tell us about your. Uh, you've done a lot of color collaboration mm. work on CRTs, but tell us about your. Mm. The underlying yep. love of the CRT. Talk us the backstory. Talk us your love of these devices. Yeah, wow. Well, I mean. It, it just goes back to these original consoles and computers, right? Like that's that's was the display mechanism for them, and that that was part of the for me the visual characteristic of it, right? Like it's it's I, like I look at all the stuff today. Like you've got the um, you know like the RetroTink five uh, X, right? Like and and the stuff Mike Chi just keeps pumping out on Twitter. Like he's doing these new. Um, you know, new video modes and new scaling modes and, and new effects and, and new filters. And he's now got this like uh, 4K 24 um, hertz mode, which is not really good for playing games, but it's good to at least see where scalers are going and stuff. And people are getting down to like trying to simulate the, you know, the, the bleed of a CRT line, right? So, I mean, you'd both know this, right? If you look really close, if you get your magnifying glass out or you get really close to a CRT and you see... A, uh, a light line going to a dark line, you get that like tapering effect at the end of the line. It's not like a hard stop. And whenever people do CRT filters or CRT effects in software, it's it's never that. And I don't I don't think that I'm not one of these people. It's like we'll never get to what CRTs look like. I, th I think one day it'll happen. One day displays will be fast enough, and people will put enough effort in, and they'll make a CRT like experience, right? Like one you know once these whatever. 500 hertz or whatever and 8k tvs come out or some crazy stuff like that 
I mean, it's hilarious that once the TVs are that good, we can go back <laughs> and simulate a TV from the 80s or 70s, right? Like, that's kind of weird. But, you know, the characteristics of that, I think, uh, and there's, there's, you know, there's YouTube channels like the Wobbling Pixels guy and the, there's another couple on Twitter that I follow as well. And they, they do a really good job of looking at what it is about the characteristics of CRTs that match the art of the time, right? Like art is a product of limitation, yeah. right? If you make something out of clay, you're limited to the medium, right? Or if you make something on film, you're limited to the medium of film. So, um, uh, you know, games came out then for CRTs because that's all we had. That was the only tech that was around, right? And it wasn't until LCDs became really mainstream that games really adopted to work on LCDs. And I, I kind of, I get a bit weird about when people go, oh, they take some, you know, really cool modern game and play it on a CRT. I mean, it's cute. Do like whatever, do whatever you want. I don't care. But, you know, it's it's really, I think the, the art and the medium, sometimes it's hard to uh, pull them apart from each other. And I think that for me, CRTs and the love of CRTs, like I'm sitting in this room, I've got like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in this room. I've got another... I'm going to say six in that room, maybe four in that room, uh, in my shed, which is like where I store all my shed. Uh, I, th- I think I think there's about 30 in my stockpile Dang. in my shed. And are they mostly uh, consumer yeah. sets? So I see, a, I see a sort of a BVM or a PVM sitting there. Yeah, so that's that's a PV. So I used to work for a uh, post-production VFX company and they were getting rid of a ton of them, an absolute ton of them. So I've got about... I'm gonna say this is this is the 21 the the uh, D series 21 PVM. Um, I missed out on a BVM. They they were as they were getting they're like yeah Dan whatever here take you know six PVMs we don't care you just boop. and I'm like oh I've got a friend oh yeah whatever they can take six PVMs and then the <laughs> BVM rolled out I'm like yep I'll take that and someone did a search on eBay and just went mm, no you can't have that so that's I missed out on that one by like that much that was a real a real bummer but uh, yeah no I've got I've got a stat and I've like I've given a couple away um, I've got a, a friend here so I don't know if you know the the Games X dot uh, com um, it's a like a, it's an old school like console hacking website from like before consoles were mainstream hmm. and guy runs that's a good friend of mine he lives really close to me he used to live in um in canada and run a game store there and moved to australia um and he's he like he twitch streams and he does a lot of old retro stuff and he's, he's helped me out forever like he he gave me a pc engine out of nowhere uh just out of the kindness of his heart um and yeah so i had like i got all these pvms and i'm just like right so i just turned up on his doorstep with a with a 21 inch pvm and like this is yours so he almost cried which was nice <laughs> um but yeah so a lot of crt so a, a mix right to answer your question a mix uh a lot of uh so a ton of pvms i think i've got like two 21s but the rest are like 14s okay. um a lot of a lot of domestic stuff yeah or like i've got a couple of candy cabinets in there so they're all like 30 ish inch <laughs> I've got my pride and joy is my head-to-head uh, Sega versus City with oh. Street Fighter Three Third Strike. So I've got that full kit, yeah, in that in my arcade no room. Problem. That was a surprise gift, for, yeah, yeah, surprise gift from my wife. Um, which, yeah, just Tremendous. amazing. Like I don't know how she sourced this thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep it right. That's, that's uh, <laughs> Uh, and then my favorite, my absolute favorite is that chonk, right? So that's, <laughs> it's just some garbage, garbage Chinese. It's 32 inch. It's huge. And it's like, it's terrible that you can't, you can't calibrate the damn thing. You can't <laughs> fix the convergence. You can't do anything. It's, it's got a, it's got a, like a serial connector in it. Um, but I can't get in there. Like I've tried doing probing on the lines and all that kind of stuff. So I've got to try and figure out what the magic source is to get into it. Because I'm sure, I'm sure there's a like a, a menu somewhere hidden inside it, right? That you can go <laughs> and like a lot of them I had a I had an LG here, um 16 is 9 LG that was um not too laggy. It wasn't wasn't great. I ended up getting rid of it and putting another one in here. But um, it had one of those magic menus where you push like 18 buttons on the remote and three on the side of the thing and the the cons- yeah. the uh, service menu popped up. Um, and that was cool. I could do a full calibration on that. So I got the um, the colorimeter out and uh, did all the, the the color cal on that. Um, but yeah, uh, a, a mix of stuff. There's a there's a couple here that I've hacked up, like a couple of old. I've got a wood grain one just behind the camera that I've ripped the PCB on it with stuff. So I ripped that out and bought a PCB from China. You can get like arcade machine uh, chassis 
uh, CRT chassis from China. Got one of those in, measured a few things, yep, close enough, banged it in. And so that does uh, pure RGB into it now, which is cool, but like arcade RGB. So it's like five volt sort of uh, the video RGB. Um, but that's cool. So I've got it's in a nice square box. So that's my vertical monitor. Um, I need to get a Mister set up for that now. That Mister's got a whole bunch so of cool games in it. Let's talk about that wooden one here real quickly. So that is mm. a project where did you did you like did you find this TV and you knew like this did it have a tube in it that is basically one of the ones that's they take out and it, put it, in an arcade machine so you could then just buy a replacement chassis and kind of build it around it. Yeah, as long as the pins, the number of pins right. on the neck board are the same, and you've, you've got to take a couple of uh, resistance measurements across the yoke um, for the uh, deflection circuit. So, and you, and you can so you can discharge and you can measure all that while it's discharged. Um, and yeah, as long as your pins on your neck board match up, and as long as those um, resistances for the deflection circuits are within spec, then you're good to go. You can just you can buy a chassis, and a lot of the chassis will have those measurements on it. Um, if they're not now, I haven't done this, but I've seen people do it. If the specs aren't right, you can just fudge a couple of high wattage resistors in there and make it work. Uh, I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> like, I've seen people do it and it worked, and power to them. But I don't want to try it. So uh, <laughs> Too I was much fortunate. power. I, that's yeah, the I had a. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You don't want to come home one day and burn down the whole house because you wanted to no, have a hacked no. up. Whatever. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So, so again, this this one uh, was really fortunate that it worked, um, and it's good. It it's actually it's actually the TV this one is really fortunate that it worked, and it's good. It it's actually the TV that I bought when I moved out of my parents' place for the first time. Oh, so uh, you know. Oh man, when year was yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, like. Uh, shit, I don't know. I, I mean, TVs were much better. I went, I had no money. Like, I was <laughs> dirt broke, moved out of home, and there was uh, an auction house, like, you know, a, a fair whack down the road. But I, I drove there and I was actually looking for old computer parts because at the time I was doing my uh, computer science degree. Um, and I was looking for old computer parts to, to try and have, because there was no virtual machines because I'm a million years old. So um, I was trying to look for gear that I could do my computer science degree with. And in the corner of the auction house is this banged up old TV. And I'm just like, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. Like, and it, all my mates were like, no, no, it's a piece of shit. Don't buy it. I'm like, no, I'm going to buy it. And I don't know what I paid. I paid like 10 bucks for it or something, right? Who cares? But uh, it worked. Um, so yeah, I've had this thing with me forever and it was just kind of sitting in the corner of the shed. And then, yeah, one day I'm like, mm, I want to have a go at this like chassis replacement, see what I can do. Um, yeah, measurements lined up. So, uh, yeah, it got converted. That's, and, that's, and again, it's, it's in amazing. a nice square box. So yeah. it just sits on it. So, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Like I got, I get, uh, I got asked the same kind of a question a couple, I mean, maybe a year ago from, uh, try from my life of gaming where he's like, yep. My grandparents, or he's like, I can get my grandparents' old te console television, but I don't think it works. And it's funny, I, I've gone, I like hung out with him, and he just likes, he loves the old tech, kind of. And it doesn't. Mm. He's got a lot of stuff in his place that is just like some of it just doesn't even work, right? It's just old, cool, small devices, tech yeah, things, yeah. right? And so he's like, I think I want to just keep this. And he's like, What do I do? should I really worry about restoring it and getting it working again to use? And I'm like, ah, pro it's probably more trouble than it's worth to do that. But eventually either something like what you're talking about or the open source, if you really want to do something. But I was like, for you, man, I was like, you mm. just need to you know, take it just, but, but I think that's cool how you took yours, stashed right. it. And then now it's now you're, I'm sure you look at that thing now and you're like, yeah, I'm really, that's a cool, like, would you ever, yeah, like, is, it, is it like a limb now? It'd be hard to get rid of this thing. Yeah, oh yeah. I, I ne <laughs> well, I'd never get rid of the CRTs I do have. Like, like <laughs> odd, odd exception if I give one away to a close friend or something. But yeah, my wife's always like, Dan, like for the longest time we had a, a thing here called curbside collection, right? So the the local council would encourage people to stop hoarding crap, put it out on your <laughs> on your curb, and then like they'd come by in a truck and they'd take it and get rid of it and it was like it was a fire prevention thing and you know just a cleanup thing um so i reckon for the better part of maybe five years and this is like 10 years ago so the five years leading up to that you could drive around any suburb within you know a couple of kilometer radius around me and there would just be crts sitting on the side of the street 
in bulk. And this was like just before kind of the hype of, of like retro gaming kind of boom, right? And, and people were just, yeah, just getting rid of them because they were garbage and junk. So like, you know, my 40 something collection here, uh, like a good chunk of that is just curbside stuff. And to the point where I was being picky, right? Like it was like, no, nah, no, nah, that one's got a scratch. I'm not going to take that, right? But that one, that one looks really good. <laughs> so I've, yeah, I've got some real, like I've got a big uh, Louvre one. I've got a couple, a uh, couple of Grundigs, like a couple of German brand CRTs. So um, stuff that I know is broken that I've got to fix up. Most of them are pretty easy though. I'm pretty sure most of them are just big filter caps that I've got to replace. Um, and I just need the time to do it. But um, yeah, no, there's there's quite a few around here that I love. Um, I think my favorite CRT project of all was the the post production media company I worked for previously. Um, they wanted to decorate their offices, and one of the offices they wanted to have this like sort of kitsch seventies like ugly seventies theme, right? So the whole office was that, and then the the two animation directors who worked in uh, there, they had their own offices within this sort of bigger office space. Uh, one decked his office out to look like an old school barber shop, right? So he had the barber shop chair as his work chair. He had the the checkerboard floor and all that kind of stuff. So his was kind of cool. The guy next to him had an office that was like a toy store. So he collected figurines. So he had all his figurines all around the thing and it, it looked like a proper toy store. And then they managed to find one of these old like 1970s, you know, you've got like the... Um, the record player and the radio and the TV all in one, one of these massive oh, units, like right? Cabinet. Huge yeah, bloody yeah. thing. It was huge. Yeah, like yeah, like huge. Thing, and it yeah. took like four of them. Yep, yep. Took four of them to lift this thing and bring it in. Um, and they put it in. And like they all knew I was into my CRT. So the first thing was like, get Dan in here. So Dan runs, yeah. oh, what do you guys got? CRT. Oh my God, it's the most beautiful thing ever. Does it work? And they're like, well, we don't know. Why would we turn it on? They're like, turn it on. <laughs> so we turned the thing on, nothing, it's dead. And I'm like, oh, it's a bit sad. And then we're, so we're talking around, st- standing around t- talking shit. And then it fires up out of nowhere. And <laughs> it was it was all tube, like tube based, right? So the old school vacuum oh, tubes yeah, in the back yeah, of this yeah. thing. That's, yeah, yeah. And so it just had to warm up. Things right, just had to warm right, up. Yeah. Everything had to expand. And then bang, the thing fires to life. I'm like, you are kidding me. So it's an old black and white set, but like with the bluish tinge, right? So everything's got a bit of blue tinge to it. No white balance or anything like that. Um, and it takes RF input. So it we're in a, a company that did post-production and like they had broadcast trucks and all this kind of crap. So I'm like straight into engineering. Have you guys got RF encoders? And they're like, yeah, we've got like thousands of these things. We don't use them anymore because who uses RF? I'm like, great, <laughs> grab some of them, race back in, RF encoder, Raspberry Pi, bang, 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 got the thing fired up. Sure enough, picture comes out of this thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. The hardest thing was um, a lot of the RF encoders use UHF, right? Like the higher yeah. frequencies. Okay. This, one, this one was like the low frequency. So I had to find one out of the five million of these things they had, find one that didn't do UHF. Found that, put the Raspberry Pi in it, and the the guy who was in the barbershop um, office, he was the biggest Doctor Who fan. Like, loved, loved, loved Doctor Who. Um, so, uh, straight on the torrents, download every black and white Doctor Who I can find, put them in a Raspberry Pi, wrote a script so the Raspberry Pi would fire up and just play a random black and white Doctor Who episode. And so, that TV just lived its life playing black and white Doctor Who. And it was it was ridiculously clear. Like, I never thought something from that era with that technology and RF into it would be so crystal clear. So, I I've, I've did post a photo... To Twitter with it, um, it's way back in my feed. There, you have to scroll back <laughs> years. Uh, but man, that thing was beautiful, and that like that is my number one favorite CRT project of of any kind. It was just so cool. I love That's it. an awesome. Yeah, that is an awesome story. And then now mm. people probably talk about, oh, remember that time Dan came in there and somehow got Doctor Who yeah, yeah. to work on that freaking mm. ancient TV. Yeah, that's, uh, Dan, what's your and take you get on different, like, why it was so clear? Like you said, it was clear. Was it just you kind of got it all right, or something about that? Just suddenly glimmered, and in your mind um, it became. Or what do you think? <laughs> I think because it was black and white, right? So literally, this thing was just uh, mm. Luma, no Chroma. So sure. and I, and I think you you know when you start when you start playing with Chroma, and when you've got the RGB guns, right? You have to line everything up and get your convergence right, and all that kind of. So all that comes and all the, the focal issues that come with that. So when, when, you, when we calibrate a modern set, we put a lot of time into aligning three 
pictures to be one picture essentially right you've got a red picture green picture mm. blue picture in entirety that we try and glue together so i think because it was an old black and white set and because it was literally just luma there was no chroma whatsoever i think it was just so so much easier for them to manufacture you know vacuum tubes <laughs> to produce this nice <laughs> sharp picture well, which it, was just mind-blowing so that's that's an interesting one so there's a pvm that's like a 12 or 13 inch security monitor i had run across one time and it only accepts compile but it's a black and white tube and i've torn it apart yep. i did a little video on it and it's but it's different but it, it was a either 900 or 1000 line tube in this uh black and white version which is way higher than any pvm would be mm. and it was just composite now they did break off and have a sync so you could kind of use an s get an s video signal into it and just show the luma but yeah that was like what you're saying it was unbelievably clear on just mm. that line and and that's a good point where uh we'll talk about we need to start talking about some calibration stuff where yeah you are in a mm. color set always trying to converge properly those three beams into the same spot on, How uh, does a on black and white mask. only set work? Does it have just one gun for Luma? Yeah, it yeah. just has the single. Yeah. So there's no there's no convergence mm. alignment mm. for a mm. set because it's just shooting out the single beam, so it doesn't have to converge really with itself. Um, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, let's a, let's a jump and over yeah. and uh, we. I mean, I've I, like it's so awesome. This is I, I know Dan's projects for years um, just because. You've been writing for, uh, I think, I mean, I imagine the first time I saw anything from you was something you'd written on our retro RGB. And then yeah. um, what really got, I knew, I knew it was like a lot of MAME stuff, but then you came out with this incredible, um, not, you know, series of videos on color uh, calibrations. Yep. And it's it's been great for me because at the time, I mean, I built my channel and, and Honestly, like the majority of the stuff I've been dealing with on is is um, geometry related, uh, performance related, as in like the hardware getting up to spec mm. as far as being able to then be color calibrated. But I never even had like this equipment that you had. And then you came out and I was like, oh, this is awesome. So now anytime anybody asks me about color, I'm just like, go look here. This is <laughs> amazing yeah, cool. stuff. So. Yeah, I didn't know if uh, what what got you like thinking about that, and like how did you come to the point of? Um, I mean, I probably it probably explained in your video. It's been a while since I've watched it, but I can't remember if you want to talk any about what the equipment, sure. and, like how getting that was. Was that a work thing or? Yeah, so through again working post production VFX, color is kind of it's it's all part and parcel right so um you know we did uh the company that i work for then uh, there's a couple of them right so um i've kind of gone through a few studios and, and now i contract out to studios as well as do other high performance supercompute stuff but um yeah the color stuff is is pretty vital right like if you if i mean imagine sitting in a cinema and watching a film and the colors are wrong like that sucks so um the whole workflow of color is is pretty complicated. So anybody who's worked in movies or post or video or anything kind of knows that. Um, and, and every step of the way, you're striving for accuracy. And and it's there's there's a, a color science, like an actual science and math side to it, where it is like you know you want to you want to take your input source and you want to take your the monitor that the editor's using, and you want to know that you're going out to a certain type of projector, and you have to know the characteristics of all those things, and you have to be able to map those characteristics between the devices to know that you're in the same sort of ballpark, especially for things like gamma and and luminance, right? You want to make sure those things are representative to people making artistic decisions so that when the fire, because, you know, you can't, it's expensive to rent out cinemas or to have cinema projectors. So visual effects studios and things like that, the bigger ones, will, they'll just have their own, but the smaller ones often won't. They'll, they'll rent time um, at places that do have them. Um, so they want to make sure that all their ducks are in a row before they get there. So the whole color workflow is important. Um, and then, you know, likewise, just from an artistic point of view, if you've got an editor or an artist sitting at a workstation and they're looking at something and the screen's too blue or too red, that's going to completely destroy whatever artistic intent they have behind it. 
So, a big part of my job was mass color calibration, right? So, I had 400 artists sitting in, you know, 20 locations around the world and I have to make sure that all their screens look the same so that when someone in Spain sends something to someone in mm. Hong Kong and then review it back in Brisbane, like everybody's looking at the same picture. So, part of what I did was develop a couple of workflows around using... Um, you know, not cheap but not expensive color emitters. So the device, the little hockey puck looking thing that goes on the screen that measures the color. Um, and you'll see those in my videos. I, I happen to use a uh, i1, um, an X-Rite i1 based device. So they they make a, a product and then OEM it out. So there's a lot of different uh, companies that then use the same design. So my particular one's called a Color Monkey Display, but it's the same stuff as the i1 um, i1 design pro i think it's called um, there's a new one that's just come out that's a hdr model i've got the sdr model uh, but anywho yeah and and then you know there's there's more expensive ones so the ones that we were using for like mass studio stuff are like sort of in the we were buying them new at the time sort of four or five hundred bucks a piece then you sort of everything goes up in tens right so you go from that to like the the four thousand dollar one and then you go up from that to the forty thousand dollar one so the forty thousand dollar one goes to the cinema projector guys the four thousand one dollar one goes to the colorist because that person does like digital intermediate colorist all the all the like the important final color type things and then you know the the scummy vfx people get the cheap ones at the bottom <laughs> so using these devices with some open source software trying to and then, you know, on top of that, I've got juniors running around working for me who don't understand anything. So I've got to make it really like dummy proof, like put this probe here, press this button, look at graph, make sure graph is online. Yeah. So that was kind of a big chunk of my job. And then out of that, you know, I looked at, I'd just go to people's houses. You, you guys probably do it, right? You walk into someone's house and it's like aspect ratio wrong yeah. and color wrong and oversaturated and, or, or, you know, you just see stuff where people are, you know, I'm sure you guys see other people CRTs a lot based on, you know, what you do and the hobbies you have and how terrible they look, um, you know, or back in the old days, you walk into an arcade and some, like the operator hadn't properly calibrated a screen and it looked like garbage and that stuff just triggers me, right? Like I get really <laughs> cranky about that. So, so I'm like, screw this. I'm going to make a video series on like start to finish. But then the problem arises, like if you just jump in and you say to people, calibrate your screens, they're like, why? What's the yeah. point? And then so you've got to explain color temperature and white point and, you know, all this kind of like color science-y stuff. And so that, that was the first video that I did, right? The first video was Color Science 101. Like, why does this stuff matter? How do your eyeballs even work? You know, why can't you trust your eyeballs? Like, that's the big one. People, people don't believe it until they watch that video and they see I put up a couple of um, optical illusions um, and there's, there's this amazing... Um, He's a, a, I think he's a clinical psychologist in Japan, and he's got a whole website on optical illusions, and and a lot of them are color illusions, right? Like he put one up the other, he, he posts them on Twitter all the time. He put one up the other day, which was like a, a picture of a train, and there's like no red. Like you zoom in, and there's nothing red in this picture. Like he's pulled all the red out, but then you zoom out, and you swear to God, this train is red, right? Like your brain is just screaming at you, going, "Nope, it's red. It's totally red." And so you start to put all this together and you realize that, you know, you, just eyeballing things is hard. You can't eyeball a set. You, and it's one of those, what do they call it? Quantifiable, but not qualifiable. Other way around, qualifiable, but not quantifiable. So you can, you can look at a set and you know it's wrong, okay. right? And, and you just, yeah, that's wrong. But then you fiddle with the controls and you're like, ah, I can't get it, I can't get it, I can't get it. And then you bang a color imiter on it and you do the stuff that you're supposed to do and all the graphs come out great and then you, take all that crap away and you sit back and you look at the set and you go, wow, this is amazing. This is what the picture was supposed to look like. Uh, if you're watching, I like to watch movies on CRTs. Um, it, you know, the skin tone is a huge one. Like the, the whole gamut of human skin tone, which is quite broad, it's really hard to get that right across every type of skin tone. So like you do a cal and then you watch a movie and the movie and because face we we as humans are tuned to look at faces that's our whole psychology is based on facial recognition and all that kind of stuff so any 
color weirdness in that is usually what you notice. Like if you if you go looking at TVs on a showroom floor, right? You, you want to go buy a new TV, you walk out in the showroom floor, you look at the TVs. The first thing you notice is where the skin looks plasticky or too red or, you know, like they've got the saturation too high or whatever. That's the stuff that gives it away. It's also the reason why on showroom floors, they never show people's faces. It's always like some dude snowboarding or, you know, a, a wave in Hawaii or a jungle scene. It's like bright, oversaturated colors to sell you crap. Um, and, and never the stuff that you actually can recognize and care about. Um, you know, I, I've lost count of the amount of times I've seen a chameleon on some like yeah. you know demo <laughs> video on it. It's like, like a leaf, piece of shit a about chameleons. Like a yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And it's like you can't do that. So, so anyway, yeah. Long story short, uh, you you can tell when things are bad, but you can't tell how bad, and you can't tell how to fix it. That's the problem. That's the problem with your eyes and with your brain. Your brain lies to you. Your eyes are constantly white balancing. Your right? eyes because are we just live your lenses, where... and they're like, like you're saying, they're all perspective to an individual. Yeah, so. yeah, and you know, we we don't live under white light. Like the sky is blue, and then in the evening the sky is red. But your brain adjusts. It keeps, you know, that white. It's like a camera, right? White point balance on a camera. It's constantly adjusting. Yeah, there we go. Bit of light coming in. It's constantly adjusting to uh, reset what is the zero level, right? And then adjust everything around it. And it's the same thing that lets you know when you look at something, if, you, if you've got something green and then you change the light in your room to a more, like a warmer light, a more yellow light, it still looks green. It doesn't look yellow or some other color. There we go. <laughs> My eyes are now adjusting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the, the short version, your eyes lie to you um, and it's a problem. Um, you know, you probably remember as a kid, you'd wear like um, like colored plastic lenses or whatever mm -hmm. over your eyes uh, and you'd run around doing that like an idiot for a while and then you'd take them off and everything would look weird, right? Again, that's your brain adjusting internally and, and changing and that will fix itself over a matter of minutes. But when you're trying to calibrate a set and doing that, that's what's happening, right? If you stare at red too long, you can't see the, the variations in red anymore. Your eyes have adjusted. So that we need equipment for that kind of stuff. Ironically, um, uh, dark points and light points. So when you when you're measuring where your black levels and your white levels are, your eyes are better than any equipment on planet Earth. So when you're doing yeah your your black and white levels, um, definitely just get your pluge patterns up and your 240p test suite. Get that kind of stuff working with your eye. I haven't I haven't done a video on that because it's so damn simple. But people keep getting shitty at me in the comments on YouTube that I haven't done a video on it. So at some point, I will do a video on that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like Pluge Pattern 240p test week, go, done, proper. Um, but after that, once you get into color world, yeah, using a, uh, a proper tool, uh, and they don't have to be expensive. I think the colorimeter that I picked up, I paid 250 Australian for it. So that's, you know, 200-ish, maybe 170-ish uh, US for that. And people sort of tell me, oh, it's a lot of money. Yeah, but I mean, if, you, if you're like me and you've got a ridiculous amount of CRTs, totally worth it. Mm. If you've got one, yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, but even then, they're multi-useful. Like you can, you can calibrate your OLED or your, you know, your big home TV that you watch movies on. You can calibrate that as well as your gaming CRT. You can do both. Um, your, your PC monitor, you can calibrate as well. So you, know, you can go through the whole lot. Would that color work screens. on LCD uh, or OLED or something? Yep. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, it's tricky. Yeah, it is tricky now. They're, it's harder to find ones that work on CRTs. So mm. what it is, it's whether or not the display is a refresh-based display or whether it's a, a hold, store and hold-based display. That's, that's the trick. Um, so the ones that work on CRTs will also work on plasma. Um, the ones that work on LCD will also work on OLED. So they're your kind of your families. Okay. The the X rights that I've got, the i1 Display Pros, they definitely the firmware has modes in them to understand refresh based displays, so they'll work on refresh based displays. Um, but yeah, that's that usually of I don't know. They may have existed at one point. There probably was a colorimeter somewhere in the world at one point that only did CRTs. But certainly I haven't seen one on uh, eBay. Uh, in a long time that is a CRT only one. So yeah, uh, multi-useful. If you get one for your gaming CRTs, they will absolutely do your your home theater as well. How was right. it when um, when you were setting up these things for in your work and you said there were graphics artists all around the world, remote locations. Um, 
so you could get your tool and your tool, you could talk them through getting a color calibrated screen. But as you said, color is a subjective. Are there some people that just can't work in VFX because they see it differently? What were the what was the human factor of those 20 different people all looking at one calibrated screen? Yeah, I, um, I think ego was probably a worse <laughs> problem than biology, right? Um, and, and, the, the example I give is we had a, we had a really nice coffee machine in the office uh, and there was always some idiot who would come along and tweak the grind yeah. on the coffee machine because they knew better. And the color's the same. There's always one person somewhere who's like, no, 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 I know better. You haven't set the blah, blah, blah right and they'll tweak the, the whatevers and then their monitor stuff. So that was more of a problem. In the real world, that was way more of a problem. We definitely had people, I've worked with colorblind artists um, I worked with one guy who he could only see shades of brown or I mean I assume that's what he said so how does he know what shade it really is if it's <laughs> colorblind but um, yeah he, he did traditional art as well so he, he would just do um, monochrome painting so he'd just get one shade and just do everything in monochrome and he was a beautiful like hand painting artist um, and then yeah there, I've definitely worked with people with different levels of um, colorblindness over the years but I think, you know, like VFX is a, it's a complex art form, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people who are just lighters and people who are just modelers and people who are just uh, riggers and people like there's, there's a whole gamut of uh, jobs within VFX. So even if people have a biological limitation, like I, I uh, worked with people trying to do 3D stuff. So we do VR and we do 3D movies and that kind of stuff they just couldn't work on that component. They'd have to do something else. Uh, but, the, I mean, there's a million jobs to do in VFX for any given movie, so it's not like we're ever short on on work to do. Um, quite the opposite. Usually it was, you know, we, we need to do a 500-person job and we've only got 400 people. How do we make this work? That's usually the bigger problem. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no, definitely there was, there was human factor involved in that. Uh, but, yeah, more ego than biology for sure. <laughs> mm. yeah this isn't right oh man i had uh it was funny talking about the um having that mm. tick when you see something wrong with this display when you walk into a room i had a i had a job for a few years or not a job i mean this is while i was working on crts there's a couple museums that contact me in the united states and one of them had bought loads of pvms from me and this is uh three or four years ago it was philadelphia at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, huge, huge museum. And it was so cool because by the third trip, uh, the curator that I worked with would just take me around. Like uh, we'd, I'd always show up on the day they were closed and she would just take me around and show me all this stuff and just give me like behind the scenes, let me look at whatever in this whole museum. And then they'd take me around back and I'd go into the AV department and test my monitors with the tech and uh, engineer there but what i would do is they're like well let's sh would you like to see the project that the last monitors you had are on and i was like oh yeah absolutely and it was this crazy bruce nauman piece if you want to look him up called clown torture and it was just a, a freaking medical pvm in a corner on a pedestal with a clown uh -huh. video going <laughs> on a loop for like hours yeah and then all this weird other Andy Warhol looking kind of stuff. But in the other room, they had these 2030s set up. And I go in and one of them's got a scrolling video. And it's just black and white scrolling video. And I'm like, oh, man, somebody's like, this is screwed up. So I'm back there like tweaking. There's a V hold. And so I'm like turning it and it's just getting worse. That's the like, effect. Oh, wait a second. Yeah, yeah. This is actually <laughs> supposed to be scrolling. There was a, a bar around here somewhere that had the same thing. They had two or three CRTs outside um, and they had that kind of, yeah, vertical hold effect. And yeah, I said to the owner, hey, do you want me to fix that? And they're like, fix what? Like that's that's the video. So yeah, I, yeah, definitely, definitely made me twitchy. <laughs> well, maybe one of you can explain to me. I, I know that... Um, a lot of people know that um, to one of the uh, still existing uses of CRTs in the mainstream normie world is museums use them a lot. Uh, medical people, I had my, uh, um, well, you'd say sister-in-law, she's doing psychology. She said she's still seen a couple of PVMs hanging around the university. Uh, and we got to talk about that. Someone I'd never thought I'd talk about refresh rates with, you know, my, my biology, uh, psychology people. Um, but museums, why... Is it just that museums are used to it now, that this is what we display the art? Why do museums love CRTs? 
Uh, well, I can give you the perspective of yeah, what they, to- they they actually told me. They told me, because they would be very specific. They would, uh, especially this Philadelphia, they'd curate and they'd be like, we need um, six 2530 PVMs. And it's like, it can't be any other model. And the idea is they're going, so they're, re- they're always recreating some art that was done before and like they want they can't they're like it's not part of it i don't know it's like taking a movie and then you're all of a sudden changing things like dan said this is a medium this is part of it's 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 like saying you're gonna take the um the uh leonardo like a leonardo da vinci painting and transfer that into a hologram image and call it the same kind of Mm. deal so these are usually like artistic art integrity. pieces that were made back in the day when all they had, and we talked about artistic intent, we don't want to change that. Because I think I was thinking, okay, I'm an artist today, why would I choose a CRT over some other flat panel for my new project that I'm coming out with? Now, probably you're an artist, so you work <laughs> in very mysterious ways and in any like that. But okay, so, you, so Steve, your experience was it's a lot of recreations of classic art that was once displayed on a CRT. That's what you saw. Yeah, and and this that when I would go on those curated walks with the with the curator, she was that was what she would always tell me that she would go into the specific details of how difficult it was for her to acquire these pieces to go in this art display uh, because it's just almost like a movie. They like go and make like a contract right to basically show this artist's work, and they have to come to an agreement on that, and the artist. Uh, you know, they're very specific on the way their art is going to be set up somewhere. And so they, it's like an integrity. It's like, yeah, you, and, and they were very much like, you know, I mean, one of the projects, this isn't even a CRT, it was ridiculous. It was an Italian, the, it was an Italian piece from the 1950s originally, and it was set up, the original piece was in the actual courtyard of a very small village in Italy. And it was like these weird fountains and like a cure a block and like rotten food on it it's just really weird stuff and part of it had these hay bales and the hay bales um she was telling me she's like yeah we had to go find uh somebody who could make this specific hay bale in italy so it would look just like this shape and size of this hay bale in the original piece and so some farmer she was like, I think he was lying, but she, so she's like basically been conned by some local farmer in Italy who sold her ten thousand dollar a piece <laughs> hay bales, <laughs> swearing they were artistically correct to this piece. And just because he lived in the village, he convinced him. I don't know. It was it was really funny. That day. Yeah. So I don't know. Do you have? I mean, is that kind of? I don't know. Do you have any? Yeah. Not uh, experience not on the not on the artistic on side. Perspective um, on the medical side have a little bit um, because of the color range of CRT. So that you know, color, CRTs can show a much higher color gradation than almost any LCD even today. I think um, it, it, things things are getting close. Hmm. Um, but yeah, CRTs can show like. It, it, You've got to differentiate the source from the device, though. But because it's uh, it's an analog display, you you know you can have literally many millions of colors, uh, tens of millions of colors that the actual display itself is capable of showing. So particularly when it comes to medical stuff, PVMs were so sought after because um, you know you're often you're looking at stuff where it's like some sort of scan or, you know, whether it, it's uh, a camera that's looking up something or in something uh, or whether it's, a you know, a machine that scans something. And, you know, you're always looking for that shadow, that shadow that could be whatever, a tumor or this or that, right? So those those gradations of color and the accuracy of color um, and the medical equipment generating the images is high quality. They don't use any compression on the medical images. They don't use, like, nothing is is like the sort of the garbage content that we get um, that we put into our CRTs. So for them, it was about that color accuracy um, and particularly LCDs, you know, again, I don't know what it's like today. I, th- I think LCDs today are doing a better job, but I do still think that they are limited in their full maximum ability to, to show very close 
color differentiations, right? That's that's the tricky bit. OLED obviously is totally different. So OLED is is you know um, matching or surpassing CRT, um, probably matching in terms of the the volume of color it can produce. Definitely surpassing CRT in the brightness that it can produce. CRTs can only get so bright, which is one of their downsides. Um, so yeah, so that you know, and then obviously having the true black as well. So um, Sony obviously make a bunch of PVMs in OLED these days, uh, horrendously expensive, but definitely like medical imaging OLED stuff exists today uh, for that same reason, for that sort of color accuracy reason. And, and again, those things, you know, calibrating those things is extremely important. Because you know you don't you don't want a bad calibration to misdiagnose a tumor or something, right? Like that's that's not cool. Yeah. No. Um, so that's that's an interesting perspective that I'd never really even considered. Then, and, and it's funny because um, last week when we were recording our podcast, uh, Lewis, we were talking about the OLED PVM and like what the difference would be on its performance compared to say just a run of the mill. Standard um, one you like, let's say a re- one you pretty go good buy off the shelf. Buy today right? So I've, I've a, used a, a couple of them. Um, they are horrendously expensive. Um, I think yeah. now we're talking a couple of yeah. years ago. Now I remember one came in the door and it was whatever fifty five, sixty grand or something like that that we ended up purchasing that for. Uh, and tiny, right? It's like a little, little, yeah, whatever. No worries, uh, yeah. Client paid for it, whatever. Uh, twenty, like twenty one inch, uh, but sixteen is nine, right? So it's, it's really, really <laughs> tiny. Um, yeah, horrendously expensive, but the color on them, my God, like the color is perfect, just perfect, perfect. And, and, you know, you think you look at a nice display and you think that's nice. And then you see this thing and you see quality footage shot on a quality camera, right? Like one of these ARRI cameras that's shooting, you know, insane color depth and, and raw uncompressed footage. And you're seeing what's coming off this camera through this screen and you just realize how shit your home setup is <laughs> like in that instant you're like oh you cry i will never see a picture this good again um and you know like we're getting close now i think in the consumer realm like if you buy a good quality uh lg or sony top of the line oled um and you feed it like these new good quality uhd 4k uh media you're getting close. It's 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 nowhere near what's coming raw off a camera because it's obviously compressed because um, we just don't have the storage medium for this stuff uncompressed. But but I reckon it's getting pretty close. And definitely uh, when I left my previous company, they were getting to the point where for some features they were even rolling out consumer LG and Sony OLEDs as the the sort of the final monitor so the one that the you know the director would come in and look at and go yep that's the shot i'm happy with uh the source was obviously uncompressed so whatever they were shooting that day they'd have a very high speed computer plugged into it with like you know whopping great big ssd arrays and nvme arrays and things like that to get enough content to it because it all had to be uncompressed but definitely the screen could keep up in terms of the um the the color quality the brightness everything that they needed was good enough that they didn't you know a whatever, a five or 10 grand consumer OLED was, you know, 99.9% as good as the 50 grand PVM, but bigger. So uh, that was nice as well. And and that was, you know... The- so it was a cost, be- like a, that was a cost of benefit yeah. analysis, not like, oh, but it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't saying, oh, this is what Correct. people will probably watch it on. So I'll finally master Correct, it on yeah. this. So mastering is still thing. done on the good okay. stuff. There's still a, a final check in on our, you know, on a real projector in a real cinema, like all that stuff's got to happen. But definitely, uh, you know, it's, it's there. Every director is different. Um, every one of them has got their own wants and desires and needs and quirks and, and attitudes. <laughs> um but yeah, yeah. Uh, no, there was there was definitely more and more productions towards the end where where um, these consumer OLEDs were going. And again, like that for me, I'm now finally kind of happy with uh, non CRT screens for the first time in a long time. I'm looking at you know 4K OLEDs going. Okay, we're getting close to what I would consider good enough for me. Um, and I, I think I think the next gen that's coming out, right? So we're going to have, um, you know, we're going to have better contrast again with like higher brights. Um, you know, we've got all this new HDR tech that's coming out. Uh, we will see 8K soon. I'm hoping to see higher refresh rates. So getting into like, and that's good for retro gaming, right? Higher refresh rates. We always talk about 
you know 240 hertz and whatever else and mm. people are like who cares but for us where we're you know you want to feed it a super nintendo which has got the world's jitteriest sync right like you frame by frame this thing is doing something different every single yeah. time because crazy jitter all through the console so you know you want to feed that into something like a retro tink or you want it coming out of a mister with like perfect sync going into a tv you're going to need a tv that can do 240 hertz plus um, with variable refresh to make sure that all these weird refreshes coming out of these old consoles are bang on and you're not missing anything um, and that's that's pretty critical and key i think um, so it's yeah it's kind of weird it's kind of weird that these you know bleeding edge tvs are finally good enough for retro gaming <laughs> Finally good enough. I, I did have kind of an idea. I was thinking about this because we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, the next step and, and, and kind of um, how I was getting a little idea of perspective a little bit because when we're talking about like PVMs and BVMs that are CRTs or any real professional one, uh, especially ones that are in the, made in the 90s up to the early 2000s, that is literally after over a hundred years technically of crt tube technology being engineered and perfected they i don't i don't i was like i was like there will never become a time that that kind of time period on one single level of technology other than like i don't know phones it's like that's not gonna happen like that does not happen you never sit there and stay on one level of that was the best of the best, yeah. And, and I think, really, I don't think you can get so, much better. Like, say we had another another 20 years of CRTs, right? Say the LCD phenomenon never took off. I, I don't know how much better you could make it because, you know, the, the cycling circuitry inside to do the refresh rates couldn't get much higher. The dot pitch couldn't get much lower. And, and where you can see it, right, is in PC CRTs, right? So if you look at high-end pc and mac crts they're going up to you know they could do some crazy resolutions right so like 1600 by 1200 pixels or whatever um 85 hertz you think about the the refresh rates internally the horizontal sync that these things are doing is, is pretty damn crazy um but even then they had a limit to the dot pitch right how fine the picture could get and how sharp that picture could get there was an upper bounds limit and even in the really expensive stuff mm. Um, you know, there just wasn't that, you know, we were seeing leaps and bounds and then it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think, I just think that, um, you know, even with another 20 years, we probably wouldn't have seen anything better than PVMs and BVMs or like your high-end Trinitrons, right? Like I've got a, over here, I've got a 21-inch Trinitron hooked up to my Dreamcast. Um, and I absolutely adore that. I think that's just the sexiest way to play a console like that. Um in vga mode um but yeah like that's it just won't get any better than that in in that technology and it probably wouldn't have yeah i think you're right i think i think it was capped out and it would have um because like when i talked to pat on the uh on like the d series bvms and the tubes and stuff He's it basically the technology was there um, to do more with the hardware that was driving, but the tubes, they just couldn't handle it. It's like you've reached the maximum potential of what the tube could do. Actually, I was laughing. I was looking up the stats on my uh, C520 back here because it's ridiculous. It does have a 85 hertz refresh rate, but the top resolution on it is 2048 yeah, by 1536. Nuts, right? like the, the number of pixels you could. I yeah. mean, that's. Yep. That's nuts yep. for a CRT. But again, you wouldn't see much out of that, right? Like you you jack that resolution up and it, it just wouldn't look cleaner. <laughs> you just couldn't do much no, with it. Like, no, that's the thing. I, I'm like, I'm I, like you said, I love running the thing yeah. at uh, throwing 480p in it. And it just looks awesome. I'm like, I can, I can sit there and adjust that and make it look like higher resolution, but it just doesn't, it doesn't move me the way the 480p does. I think we lived through a very interesting time in display technology that we we sort of when we were looking and we were into it we lived through an entire generational change from the CRT to the flat screen and we're seeing that evolution and I I kind of think we're having almost like the mid technology lifespan slowdown. I technology's still progressing but is the 8K OLED is it going to be better and blowing me away and amazingly more than what is out there right now. I don't think so. I think it's very incremental from here on where we kind of live through this time of like, no, that behemoth elephant is gone. Here's something completely different. So it was very obvious. It was very visceral change. 
and that's why I think something like the OLED PVM that we've talked endlessly about, I don't think that will fall out of style, even though it's 10 years old. It's still an extremely relevant monitor 10 years on, still expensive because it's still relevant. And I think it will remain relevant for the next, maybe even next decade, uh, because it just genuinely does a great job at that sort of thing. Uh, it's incremental now, not the crazy days of change that we, we saw. Yeah, definitely. Say, I think, um, you know, not in your living room, definitely. That's where kind of stuck now at these resolutions and going higher doesn't help us and, and getting better doesn't help us. Uh, you know, I'm always interested in... I, I personally don't enjoy VR so much, but the whole, like the technology around that is suffering because uh, they can't get the resolution close to the eyeball, um, right? So, so I think the shrinking of pixels is going to help that, right? Like 4K, 8K resolution, if they can get these dots down small enough and close enough to your eyeballs, good. Then you've got the whole depth perspective thing as well, which is troubling because you you are focusing at something that's very close, but it's pretending to be far away and that messes up your your belief in how far away it is. So mm. I, think, I think there's a lot of challenges for VR um, in terms of that. And I think I think that's where the improvements will be seen with, with increasing display technology is when we're getting really close to the eyeball but yeah definitely in your living room um you know i I can just see the difference between hd and 4k sitting way back on the couch if i get pretty close i can definitely see it if i sit i mean i'm getting old and i need glasses now so that's that's another thing too but (laughs) but yeah i i wonder right 4k to 8k is that going to be a big deal um, it's going to make my, um, you know, my retro tech, uh, 10 by or whatever Mike G comes up with. It's going to make that look great. Uh, <laughs> but, but who yeah, cares right. about uh, anything else? Yeah. Well, I want, I want to say something too, cause I feel like, uh, lately, uh, people are getting the wrong idea sometimes about our opinions too on this and, uh, this like CRT elitist thing. And like, we are all very supportive of each other. Like I've, ne- I mean, I, I, I truly the hell out of Mike Chi because he's mm-hmm. like accomplished what no one else can do. And that's like reliably stock his product and not just say, Hey, if I, if that was me, I'd have probably stopped at that and just gone yeah. on vacation. <laughs> Okay, but he's sitting there like listening to every uh, anal nerd out there who wants a CRT filter or, you know, a resolution settings pumped into this firmware that he's like perfecting it. So um, like I have so much and I I mean, I know Mike, it's like I I have respect for him. And so um, and then at the same time, people like, oh, you're only you're only talking about PVMs yet. Just like you, I have my some of my favorite CRTs are not PVMs or BVMs. They're either, like you say, PC CRTs or really composite only uh, rare, weird 13 inch CRTs that are just odd that work and I love them. And it's, uh, so there's like, yeah, we, we're all, you know, don't get confused. We're not sitting here beating the war drum of CRTs only, uh, but you know, we just love them. And, for, for sure, I uh, Mike Mike Chi <laughs> really blows my mind because you know what he does with the whole retro team thing. That's his side gig, right? That's not his full time job. That's his yeah. that's his side gig. Yeah. yeah, that's not that's the thing. Yeah, he, he's got yeah. A, he's a brain yeah yeah and I've, like yeah what he analyzer. does for reals is like proper difficult, right? So like I I'm amazed that he fits so much in his head. That that in itself is amazing. But yeah, definitely same page, right? Like I've some of my favorite CRTs are garbage crts they really are but i love them like it, it, there's no there's no sensible nature about it it's just it's totally subjective it's what i love it's you know it's what i like to geek out on that's that's my my passion um and yeah certainly not an elitism about it i think think people need to differentiate between what you're passionate about and what you're elitist about i think they they sometimes maybe one crosses over in the other but yeah definitely not yeah either. yeah yeah I think, I mean, for us, it would be perfectly fine if everybody had a CRT. Yep. <laughs> We'd love it. I mean, like, uh, but, but at the same time, it's not feasible for some people. So yeah, you know, you're not, it's not, it's not a bad thing. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, the, the thing I wanted to, uh, you've been saying that you worked on, um, you work on stuff for VR now. Is that right? Like professionally? Yeah. Is so, I mean, I do a lot. Of, I run my own business and consult out to different places. Um, and so some of my customers do VR stuff. Um, AR stuff is starting to pick up as well. Uh, augmented reality. So, you know, where, yeah. So that's, um, 
whether it's like uh, goggles that people are wearing and they're looking at a real scene and it's integrated between virtual and uh, and real, or whether it's phone-based stuff, um, there's a lot of that going on. But yeah, a fair bit of VR, um, mostly in like the like some of my customers have done things like uh, safety training and things like that. So you know the whole like simulate escaping from a burning building kind of thing right it's a, it's a lot cheaper and safer to put people through that in vr a dozen times before you go and you know build the simulated burning rig and put them through that which is you know for certain professions like if people work in oil and gas or things like that like they they have to go through that training uh if they're on rigs and things like that so very very expensive to do safety training starts to become pretty useful if you do it in vr uh, but also entertainment, right? Like there's a lot of gaming stuff that people are doing. Um, yeah, there's, there's a fair bit of that. I have seen people attempt uh, movies, getting movies over into VR. Um, it's always interesting. It always fails. <laughs> I've, I've never seen a commercially successful one. Yeah, that seems, yeah that the seems problem with a movie, like, uh, the whole point of a movie is capturing the viewer's gaze and making them look at something, Right. And the moment you put, yeah, right. So you, you get some di- some director it, right? who's like VR is the future, and you go, mm, okay, whatever, fine, we'll do this thing. And uh, they they do their art piece, and they're very proud about their art piece, and they want to do you know the the audience testing. So they get some goober in, and they slap the goggles on the goober, and they go, right, goober, watch this art piece. And the first thing the goober does is like look around like this, and the director's like, no, look at that thing, and it just doesn't work. Yeah. So you know, like video games, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yep. You got like yep. the emotional piece happening over care. here, and yet this yep. guy's like, yep. "Did I just yep. see a tree over yep. there?" The, I yep. know what that is. That's a maple tree, and you're like, "Dude, like, you so just missed it." The- <laughs> Pretty much, like a GTA pretty much. Cut scene like, or something. Video games have incentive, right? Like if you don't pay attention to the thing you're supposed to pay attention to, you die, right? Like yeah, come whatever. So yeah, you die. so there's yeah, I think. Yeah, video video game yes, VR yes. works uh, because of the urgency, whereas oh. film just doesn't work because uh, you just wander off. There's yeah. an incentive to look at that particular thing. We're in a big yep. wide world. I can look at anything. So why am I looking at those exactly. two people having exactly. that exact conversation? Huh. Well, And that's the first thing. Everybody, <laughs> I don't care who it is, every yep. person you slap that vr headset in there on their heads the first thing they're going to yep. do if they're yeah. in something they're doing <laughs> every time it. it's the very first yeah, thing yeah. they're doing because it's yep. it's that's what you want to do it's like yep. oh this is different so let's do this that's it's, it's it's just like human reaction is that similar though when the because the technology is so new maybe if uh, for we're saying for the kids they're going to grow up with that natively they're going to whack the goggles on and go i'm good to go like when you walk into a cinema right now, you're not like, what is this motion picture moving images? Who can say? <laughs> you're like, no, it's a cinema. I know everyone knows what a cinema is. Uh, maybe there's yeah. that level of comfort. Yeah, comfort look, I, I think um, it's interesting home. because how many people at home watch Netflix and they're also on their phone? Like keeping people's attention where it's supposed to be kept is, yeah, yeah, is My really mom. difficult. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get used to the idea of uh having the freedom to do whatever we want inside an art piece where things get boring from time to time right some director's vision of this beautiful emotional set piece and you're like meh that's boring i'm gonna wander off over here i I don't know i don't know if we'll ever get used to it i think it would literally have to be some extreme artsy fartsy piece where it literally like here you're like you can look around and and you look look yep. around and it's just yep. like just an darkness. empty white room yeah. of nothingness right <laughs> you know it's like the it's like the matrix yeah yep. it's just like the matrix scenes where he plugs in and it's like all he has to look at is morpheus and the old tube tv and a couple of raggedy chairs there's nothing else there it's like so you can sit there and then when you want to come back and it realizes you're looking at it then the movie will start going or the thing will progress so I think it will be something like that that will either break the ice or like Lewis said, we'll finally, you know, cultural will be so um, used to the technology that they won't have the, ooh, look, it's, you know, what's going on here reaction that it'll just be us when we become the new, uh, <laughs> yeah. like boomer generation. When, when, some, when such uh, a director, and I realize it's been over the years, so technology has moved on, have they sort of grasped, are they trying to do something in VR as a director? Just and real broadly speaking, have any of them looked at video games and understood, well, you're sort of halfway to making a video game. A movie in VR is kind of just a long cut scene of a video game. How do we, have they tried to look at how video games are? Because you're sort of, 
there's really a spectrum there. The VR is really close to a video game. Have any of them thought that like, oh, I'm actually making half a video game or they're like, no, I'm a director. No, I, I think that is film. definitely happening. Um, and the, the crossover between film and video games is, is getting uh, like more and more blurred, right? Like, like you said, in, like these big video, you play like the new God of War or whatever. And it's like seamless jump between cutscene and game and game and cutscene. And, and uh, maybe even some of the VR games like Alex, the, the Steam one um, in the, um, in the Half-Life universe. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think, and directors, I think, I, uh, kind of catching on to that too definitely and a lot, i mean a lot of the text steve had to oh, no that's right sorry uh, sorry a lot of the text the same too right so there's more and more films are using um unreal engine and things like that to do uh parts of the stuff so yeah i, I think the mm. crossover is definitely there um and that that's pretty interesting too because there's there's now three right like there's there's the pure movie and the pure video game in that half half world and people are experimenting a lot in that half half world uh, and i'm involved in a couple of projects now actually that are like that they're all under nda so i can't talk much about them but they're definitely um yeah they're definitely uh trying to bridge that gap and come up i guess with a new type of media that's not one or the other which is really interesting yeah hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. I actually, my uh, my son for his la like, my son always is like, oh, I want this thing, and I'm and it's some technology that's new, and and so I'm like, well, I don't care. You just save up your money and get it. And uh, he did that last year with the Oculus Two headset, which was kind of funny because he used it for like a week, and then it was one of those things he just set down. And, Even like, if his own money, there now he inspire him. Even his yeah. own money. Even his own money, I was. That's why I'm always like blown away by it. Like he'll, <laughs> same thing. He did it with the switch, but he actually plays the switch. But um, I try to like let him to then take care of it and like kind of have some personal responsibility. But he'll like do stuff, and I'm like, why are you doing that? You spent money on that. I'm like, why did you leave it out? Somebody could grab it or anyway. But uh, yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I'm intrigued. Uh, like to the fact that it's just here that I have access to it. I don't have to like go buy it. Um, and then like, like you said, I could, but I can definitely tell where the resolution isn't high enough or something. You know, it all looks kind of a little blurry. It's not quite there. Now I am blown away by some things like, um, I don't know. It was something. The first thing I saw was like a, a discovery channel or like insect world thing on spiders. And you're like in a black room with like a giant tarantula, you know, jumping on you and it's pretty, that's pretty scary. But, um, but still it's like, you could tell where there are some things on the technology and even at this point for like the display to your eyes, it's not obviously what it is with mm. a, any yeah, like, set. Again, the whole, the focal point thing, the resolution thing, I think they're all challenges that VR are going to have to overcome to, to get mass adoption. Like it's definitely like nerds love it. Right. But nerds like anything nerdy so I'd, I'd, that's it's hard to like judge the success of something based on a group who are going to be really excited about it anyway so um yeah i don't know i don't know where it's gonna go i don't, I don't think it'll go away i hope it will improve but i i'm maybe i'm just old and grumpy but i'm kind of cynical about it a little bit uh yeah <laughs> you know i don't know <laughs> oh, looking good all right we'll get into um, Dan, I had a, sort of a couple of questions for you just based off, I think that we probably grew up in Australia mm -hmm. sort of roughly the same time period uh, or so. Uh, I turned 18 in about 98 or so and then 99 and then university yep, years. Yep, that's about bang on. Yep. yep, yep. Something something in the yep. ballpark, yeah, something like that. So the first question I had for you is, uh, as you said, you mm. were on the command line since you were a kid. In Did you grow up in Brisbane? Yeah, in so the, the uh, Brisbane yeah. as a very young child. Then I moved out west to a tiny little town called Roma. Um, lived there for a while and then back to Brisbane. So yeah, that's kind of been my uh, my worldly journey in one state. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So did you have, uh, when, when you first got, did you have modem BBSs where you yes, were? Yes. So... That would have probably been 
we didn't have a lot of access to them when I was in the small country town because, you know, as you know, like BBSs were like, so pre-internet, yeah. so for anyone watching who's not a million years old, BBSs you had to uh, dial directly into the computer. It wasn't like the internet where you go through uh, networking or IP traffic. You dialed directly to one computer, often sitting in someone's house, maybe not, maybe it was a business that was rare, but that person would have many phone lines uh, with a modem bank and they would allow a certain amount of people to log on at the same time given how many phone lines they had. So if they paid for eight phone lines, they could have eight simultaneous users. Um, so you would dial directly into that. The problem with those obviously was long distance charges. If you wanted to dial into one that wasn't in the same city as you, then you started paying. And again, for anyone who's not a million years old, mm. there was a day when phone calls <laughs> were cheap if you called locally but were not cheap if you called far far away uh, unlike the internet which is free for everything so uh, this it's it's <laughs> wild that we have to explain <laughs> this shit and how much has changed right i know, I know right i, know. I mean you, that's yep. that's what like yep. the area code thing was yep. it was like before the area code you yeah, have yeah. to pay it's yep. like don't you dial that a different yep. area code kid yeah. and, and then like I know, like i had friends uh in the uk and they had a different system altogether like they paid per minute right like and and just it was the further away something was the more they paid per minute so even internet for them was expensive in the dial-up oh, days because it wasn't like for us it was a 30 cent call no matter what and as long as you stayed connected and you do all sorts of stuff right you'd have like a ping every 30 seconds to try and keep your thing connected and whatever else all these tricks um as long as you stayed connected <laughs> it was the one charge whereas in the uk they like it, there was a rolling charge for using the phone line and then the internet cost on top of that for certain places so anyway, yes, BBS has definitely did a lot of uh, of dialing into those. Um, I didn't have a whole lot of cool computers early on, so I miss my friends had Commodore 64s and Amigas and things like that. I was kind of a, a DOS kid at home. Uh, my first first computer was a Sega SC3000. So the if you know the Sega SG1000, so the before the Master System, um, so that came out in certain parts around the world so japan australia new zealand and maybe parts of europe definitely not north america i don't think but it came out with a keyboard so it was basically a computer so if you go to my website stickfreaks.com mm -hmm. I, I rip all my tape games and i put them up there so you can get all the tape dumps and you can either play them in an emulator or you can play them on a real sega uh retro Naz will soon have support for tape i've got a, a audio to tape converter coming and then you can like load tape games off your retro Naz onto like msx computers and and commodore 64 computers straight from retro Naz. so that's coming that's going to be cool um yeah. So yeah, that's that's great because I've got a tape player back there of like there I don't you even go. want to It'll ever use it. that thing. <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so perfect. yes, yeah. BBS dialing. Uh, nice, back man. on topic, Dan. Uh, yeah. Yes, definitely. BBS dialing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back to the ultra nerdy dead topic. Definitely a lot of dialing. dialing. BBS. Yeah, I love yep. it because that was it for me. Yep. I did. I grew up in a. I where I grew up, we were about an hour from Newcastle, but we were still within the local coal charge awesome. region yep. of Newcastle. So it was the first time I was really chatting yep. with real people. It was pre-internet, as you said. We could all dial into something, and and everyone who was yeah. on it was pretty <laughs> retarded. Like we were all yep. weird and we we're all strange. If you had a modem and you were connecting to these BBSs, you're a bit woohoo. And you had this ability, but we were all that same level of fucking stupid. So we could all bond. And it was the first time I really ever bonded with such kind of weird nerds. And I was one. And we then we wouldn't have meetups and stuff in Newcastle. <laughs> I, I can't believe this stuff. This, so so wait a second. Because like when I was good, I remember getting on the internet and it was a, it was AOL and it was stupid. It, you know, you doing the same silly kind of thing. You plug it in and, you know, you'd load a disc and then you'd weary. But this is pre that. Now you're calling pre into a call that. set. You're not so you're you're hooking up to your phone line and you're literally just calling some basically house mm. or yep. business that So you could off easily just So are you only one... connecting but are you only connecting to the other people that are connected to it like that? Is that it? Or is there are you connecting to something else? You just it's just like a, a hangout chat kind of thing over the You're computer. basically connected to that one server. Now there were some okay. server to yeah. server protocols that the the administrator, the sysop would have to instigate that there was a possibility to send some email style message between servers. But even that was a bit, 
you know, uh, you mostly just logged on to the one thing, left your message, logged off again. Back Next when there was no on. internet. It was yeah. like an early <laughs> chat room, no basically. I guess like an early chat room you could download. Yeah. It was where I got Doom from. Uh, you could get okay. pick some pictures, yep. some early shareware. You pretty much were available there. If you knew yeah, you the pirated right software people. and you you got yep. nudes, nudes, right? Like that was that was yep. kind of yeah. as a teenager. Yep, you're like hey. right. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Because uh, I could I could remember like going over to my buddy's house uh, before I had the internet, and it was like oh, man, <laughs> the internet, and then it would be literally yeah yeah line you know, by line. There, <laughs> you know the 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 image is coming down shortly, and you're just like yep. eyeing the door, making sure like the parents don't come in. It's, like, it's been 45 minutes. When is this the lengths we had finish? to go to for one picture, <laughs> and then you get yeah. it, and it's like yeah. this wasn't even a good but one. Yeah. So well, on on you know, the topic of so, BBSs. That's funny. Um, RetroNAS, so the the other uh, developers on it at the moment, Suruk, he's got a bit of software in there, uh, or oh, he would have put that in last week, I think, called uh, TCP, sir. So it's TCP SER. And the idea is that if you've got an old computer that um, can't do full blown internet, there are still people who host BBSs today, but they're internet based BBSs. So it's, it's literally just the Telnet protocol. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, so t Telnet okay. is is essentially what SSH is, a so command line yeah. only. Um, but you can do, remember the old ASCII art, right? So people would do this like special like command line art inside the BBS. Yeah, so you can do that kind of stuff. So people still host these things because people are old and nerdy like us. Um, and what you can do is through RetroNAS, you can dial these. So your, your old computer that can only understand modems, yeah, the RetroNAS device can pretend to be a Hayes dial-up modem. Um, you plug a serial cable in from your old computer to uh, RetroNAS, so you can either get a USB to serial converter, or if you've got a Raspberry Pi, you can use the GPIO pins and get a little... It's I think I, I bought 10 of them last month, and they were like a dollar each. Yeah, yeah, really cheap. Yeah, because it's just it's just a serial yeah. chip converter, like TTL to whatever. Um, yeah, and so you bang that in there, and then your old computer can you dial from it. So you put in a phone number. It's not really a phone number. It's actually the IP address, but just like a phone number. Mm. Um, and the software in the middle converts it, and it feels like you're dialing up to a BBS. <laughs> so if you want that experience again, if oh. you if you feel the need for nostalgia, oh, uh, awesome. we have that supported. <laughs> you got weirdos just sitting in their basement now, like me, just like pretending oh, to yeah. dial into their Raspberry people, Pi. People love it. I mean, I, I went to, there's a, a local <laughs> Commodore Amiga sort of group around here. And a friend of mine said, you've got to turn up to one of these things. You've got to go and meet these people. And I'm like, cool, all right, I'll, I'll go along. And yeah, it was just like just a room full of every, so like all your... Commodore 64, VIC-20, Amiga 500s, Amiga 1000, just like all these different machines that this company made and just all these people just geeking out and everything, right? Like some of them are uh, uh, just modding these things so they've got like the most modern of everything. They've got SSDs and they've got LCD screens and all this kind of crap. And then you've got other people who are going like full backwards. So they're only dial into things and they only connect to BBSs, not the internet. And like, so this full gamut of people who, who do all this stuff with these old computers. Yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Oh, tremendous. Well, Okay, I've got my retro <laughs> itch out of there. We're at about hour forty, so maybe we'll. Do you have any more? Yeah. Wait, wait. We, you did you just have a question about BBSs? You didn't want to go any further on nostalgia there, Lewis? Uh, what else? I mean, uh, the, so the, the I BBS know. came. I was thinking the BBS went. Uh, how to say the BBS was fairly quickly supplanted by the internet. Um, even for right. a while, though, we didn't. For I would still say for quite a number of years. I want to say the next five years or something. We never had a. Um, a broadband connection. You were still dialing up. Maybe you had a 56K modem. Then they Australia had ADSL, DSL, which uh, was a sort of, you could put broadband over a phone line and... Yeah, and that was, I mean, that was pretty in. horrendous too because uh, Telstra, who's our, our like main, uh, it's like AT&T um, for America is, is our Telstra. Um, and they, so they were pushed by the government to come up with a definition of what broadband was and they came up with 1.5 megabits per second that was their definition of broadband so if you went to them and said my internet sucks they do they say do this speed test and you'd be like i've got two megabit right so the us by now is on like 20 
Um, and so we've got two and we're whinging about it and then tell, yeah. So, yeah. So tell Strabid oh, is like, well, it, oof. it exceeds our definition of what broadband is. So, you know, su- suffer. So that was Australian <laughs> internet. I mean, it still kind of sucks here. No, I'm not going to lie. It, it's, we're kind of just getting out of the dark ages now. We've got this thing called NBN, which is our national broadband network, um, which is not the best, but you know, it's, it's not, not the worst. It's, it's kind of getting us in line with. Do you have a data cap? Uh, still? N- well, I, some people do. I don't um, because a big part of my job is remote access. Like I'm remoting into things all over the planet all every time. So I've got, but I, you know, I pay for that. I pay top top dollar for the, oh. the fastest, biggest thing I can okay. get a hold of. But I mean, you know, whatever. It's a, it's a work expense for me. I don't care. Right. It's here. I mean, it's funny. I moved into this old house that, uh, and it's got the, it's in a town that's got a new, um, aggressive fiber optics company that's not a- attached to like AT&T or anything and they've built great infrastructure here and uh I mean I've been just blown away with how fast the internet is now here at this house and like my my dad lives on the other side of town in the same town that doesn't have this fiber internet he has to deal with the cable company and uh it's just oh my goodness atrocious you know the um the difference like how how much like I can't even he can barely yeah, even terrible. like stream Netflix stuff sometimes. But I mean, you know, that's that was the thing about a str- Well, I was going to say like net- oh, Netflix okay. definitely is like people kind of laugh or oh, who cares it's just TV, but you know, like especially with COVID, right? Like video chat has been the huge connector of people. And like I don't I don't know a boomer who doesn't know how to FaceTime with the grandkids, right? Like that's just normal stuff. And I was talking to a guy the other day and he's he's building a retirement village and he was like, "Oh yeah, whatever. We got 400 people. We'll just put in a 100 megabit link." I'm like, "No, dude, you can't do this. Like the, this people now expect this." Yeah. <laughs> no, it's no, uh, not that's not but, possible uh, anymore. Especially as we get older, you're, you're and we're, we're the generation that's going to go into Absolutely. that nursing yeah, yeah. home. <laughs> yeah, and then guess what? They're going to have a bunch yep. of old nerds yeah, yeah, yeah. their walls apart. <laughs> They're yep. going to be like, "We need to invest in straight jackets. Something's wrong with this nerd house." You know, it's like they're slinging there pirate cables out the window. The yeah, for sure. Networking cables sure. out. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, one of the things I want to do in Retronas even is get. Um, the Raspberry Pi is cloud connected. So I, I, I've done it myself as a, a proof of concept. So there's a bit of software called R-Clone. It will let you mount Google Drive and Dropbox and OneDrive and all this kind of stuff on your Raspberry Pi. And then you can load those games straight into Mister, right? So you can you can keep your Mister ROMs in the cloud and load them straight out of the cloud via the Raspberry Pi. So that all works um, for stuff where the ROM ends up in memory. That's cool. Um, but if you want to do CD-based stuff, no, right? Because then your latency kicks in again. So PlayStation 2, GameCube, no, 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 can't do that. I think even the um, the optical-based games that Mr. Supports aren't any good. But definitely like, you know, your Nintendo NES ROMs, cool. Yeah, just like straight out of a cloud bucket into, into your Mr. That's cool. But again, you need decent internet, right? Like, <laughs> well, I mean, you don't. You can sit there waiting for it to like trickle down yeah. and load, but like the old days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I couldn't imagine if yeah you like went to the trouble of doing and setting all that up, and then you had terrible internet. Well, it's like I mean, I certainly don't. Uh, I'm not condoning the piracy, but I wonder how long it's going to be until that when that feature comes. If someone just says, "Look, here's the Google Drive," and everyone's connecting to that one particular Google Drive. Look, I've got. Um, I don't know. I'm Smoke Monster. I'm someone else. I've got yeah. everything all in one place. Well, I, you Who know, knows, maybe archive.org's kind of that already, right? Like if you jump on archive.org. It's packed full. So Andrew? there's there's yeah. the the group Redump. Mm-hmm. Um, they do preservation of optical drive stuff. Yeah. Um, you search archive.org for Redump, and you find a heap of stuff. So I think, I don't know. I wonder when, um, the legal side of it will catch up and realize that you know that's no different to a library, right? Like you can go to a library and read a book. That's not piracy. You can mm-hmm. go to archive.org and play a video game, and you can, right? You can play a heap of games on archive.org straight out of your browser. So they've got they've got emulators. So it's not like cloud gaming where uh, the picture comes to you and there's a delay and all that kind of stuff. What it actually does is it it, it re compiles the the C and C++ code of the emulator to run inside a thing called WASM. Uh, which is the WebAssembly 
something something can't remember what the other bits are for WASM and so that's that's a binary that runs inside your browser it then pulls the ROM into the web browser and it plays the ROM inside your web browser so your web browser essentially becomes the operating system so to speak and you play ROMs in there so if you go to archive.org you can play like every Sega Master System game every you can't play Nintendo stuff because they've ripped all the stuff down uh, but all the Sega stuff all the Commodore 64 there's a ton of MS-DOS stuff on there and you can play it right in your browser full speed right like no lag no anything that's really cool so you know I think mm. that's cool that's like Sure. Now the 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 site and the browser becomes the library. That's the next step, uh, and I'm hoping that more and more of that people are waking up to that, right? Because you know, I think intent comes into the conversation where you know piracy is about is is yeah, right? You, you okay, yeah. developer develop something. You want to pay developers, artists, absolutely. If you don't pay them, they don't make more stuff, and that sucks. So you want to you want to pay people for stuff that's there. But at some point, these things devalue so much that you know selling a ROM is kind of like nobody nobody wants to sell ROMs because lawyers cost too much. That's the reality of it, right? Getting licenses and paying you know royalties and blah 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 blah. All your profit sort of goes away for something that's really hard to pay for. Um, there's a good Frank Cefaldi video on it, actually. He does a, a video on... So he's a guy who runs uh, GameHistory.org. He did a, a video called It's Just Emulation at GDC, like 2016 or something. And he goes into the how hard it is to sell old video games. And it's like... and Because he worked for a company, Digital Eclipse, I think, where they, they did that. They sold old video games. And it was ridiculously hard. Like the amount of legal loopholes they had to go through to sell something that no one's going to pay more than 10 bucks for was really, really hard. So I don't know... I, I had I had this experience yeah, with Frank, yeah. yeah, where he was explaining the same troubles because it's a lot of times you try to find actually who yep. who's was the artist that worked on some game that's forty, thirty years old mm. and they might have died. You don't know who owns the you know, Although companies the gone bankrupt, some, some other companies bought them, and, split the rights, sold those rights, half the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't care. Like who yeah, and they don't care about getting involved. And especially for when the opportunity isn't there to really make a lot of it's not like you're going to make a lot of money by releasing the rom i think you bring up i mean that's an incredible point too because like intent is very important and i think the big problem has you know the tra there's been a transition of this uh, idea that piracy the real dangers for piracy is if it does like you said affects the artist and um also though if if you're trying to capitalize off piracy by means of gaining wealth of, or something like that as opposed to just um i don't think you should you know I, it's a person this is just personally but you can't it's 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 a disservice to co co you know put people who just want to go access a rom off an archive to try it it's like saying it's like saying somebody who like you say, goes into the library, opens the book and reads it or checks it out and uses it and brings it back. They're not the same as somebody who runs into a bookstore, steals books and then resells them. It's not. So maybe eventually it'll get to that point. But again, the problem is, I know, I mean, this is a huge American thing. L anything that involves uh, litigation or litigious stuff, it's yeah, you know, absolutely. That's where the sharks But even that, I think, is starting to die and because they're seeing that there's no value in it, right? Like you sue some gram... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where where are they yeah. going to get the so money? So grandma from? for playing Super Mario from? Brothers, right? Like, what what's the value? Like, your right. lawyer having lunch costs more. Yeah, that's yeah. already happened. There's been people that have been like convicted of hosting ROM sites and even like had judgments awarded against them. But yeah. it's not like Nintendo can collect. Yeah, exactly. These are broke exactly. Kids. But you know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm with you. Like, if they're, if they're making there. advertising revenue or something off it, like, that's that's a no-no. But, yeah, like, like archive.org for me is the classic example, right? There's a lot of stuff that they host. Their, their whole philosophy seems to be just throw it up there and see what happens. If someone comes along and throws a cease and desist, fine, we'll take it down. But for the most part, it's just throw as much stuff at us as you can. We'll just absorb it. We'll keep banging hard drives in the back end, you know, just filling them up. Um, and then, you know, if nobody comes 
knocking on the door, we'll host it forever. And that's a huge service, I think, in the digital age. Um, I do a bit of work with digital preservation mobs and they talk about, you know, the difference between uh, preservation where you digitize, so you, you take something that's analog, so whether it's film or whether it's uh, VHS or whether it's a book and you have to digitize that. So that's that's a different process to born digital, so things that were digital and are digital. And, you know, something, something I really like to... Like I'm a collector. I've got there's shelves of games over there behind me that you can't see. But um, I do like to annoy collectors. You know, they go on about oh, I like a cartridge because it's real, because it's physical. And it's like, well, it's a ROM chip, right? Like it's data packed into a thing in a different way. Your nostalgia for for boxes and covers and things that's cool. <laughs> like I've got that too. Like I've got a million cartridges and ROM, and you know, because I, I love the tactile experience <laughs> from a nostalgic point of view. But the game is no more special when it's on a ROM chip than on a ROM file. Like whether it's a real cartridge in my Nintendo or in my Mister, you know, and that's that's a bit contentious to say in retro circles. People get really kind of upset about that. But, you know, they're the same thing. It's the same series of ones and zeros. We can check some of them and fingerprint them and prove it digitally that that's the same thing. You know, your experience about plugging something in versus clicking a file, sure, that's different. That's the human experience. But down at that bits and bytes level, it's the same thing. So... Given that it's you know it's so trivial to copy things, it doesn't cost you any. You know if you want if you take a car and you want to make another car, you've got a time and effort and expense and parts and things. If you take a file and you want to make another file, that's like zero effort, right? Like you copy the file, you're done. So I think I think all of that's really interesting when it comes to copyright and digital heritage. The whole concept of you know how do we uh, correctly preserve what we've got so that anybody can get a hold of it. But at the same time, we make sure we pay artists for what they're doing now and possibly years on, right? Like it's not, I don't know, it's, I don't think it's right to just start ripping things off because they're three years old. Um, I think there's a sensible line somewhere. Um, and, you know, like I, I buy old games all the time, usually as a, like a, a counterbalance, right? Like for all the ROMs I've downloaded, I'll go, someone puts a retro pack out of old Nintendo games, yeah, I'll buy that and throw it <laughs> on the shelf and never touch it. But that's my like karmic balance. I've paid money somewhere for that and it makes me feel happy. So I don't know. Complex stuff, right? Well, and there's no option. It's like, well, I really love this old video game. There's no option to just go and be like, I mean, outside of going and, and collecting it, and that nobody's getting the money for that then when you're exchanging things on secondhand markets. So that's not, it's not, like you say, it's not actually, uh, it's not a, it's a lose-lose for the creator anyway, pretty much. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of these guys, they're, they're uh, when they were developing these products i'm sure that it was never in their mind that mm. they would still be relevant well really. I, I ex um yeah i experienced 40 a bit years of this ago firsthand, maybe right? i mean like I, but, i've i've worked on films I and i have my name in credits on yeah. hollywood films like there's a couple of films on netflix you can go watch you'll see dan mons fly past in the credits at the end if you pirate that film nice. i don't lose money i got paid right it's, it's done everybody i know who worked on that thing got paid right so at some point the commercial value of a thing even starts to come down to who worked on it versus who has the rights in perpetuity for things. And I also understand that, you know, a lot of people, it's about the long tail. Like it's about the fact that they lose money at the beginning to make money at the end. But yeah, definitely. It's, it's an interesting thing, right? When you come down to the nuts and bolts of why do we pay for stuff? We want to pay the people who made the stuff. It starts to get pretty tricky once you get past like, okay, it's, it's 20 years old and you're buying a third-hand copy of eBay for four times its retail price. Is, is that really what this whole system intended to do? I don't think so. Yeah, right. And then the copyright, I mean, the copyright laws, unfortunately, the way that like they have been designed... Um, originally it, it actually has led to a lot of medium like being lost uh early stuff that you know predates a lot of things it's just like disappeared nobody was interested in preserving it because again you're worried about copyrights or again some company gets the copyright law like legally owns the copyright to something that's very old and they never do anything with it so this medium physically is destroyed no longer exists you'll never be able to watch this i don't know the three stooges original from 1903 if there was something like that for a stupid example but let's say it was like the best comedy uh 
the best comedy made in 1903, some company, company gets that copyright law, sits there, never digitizes it, never does anything with it. Some guy accidentally throws it out think it's garbage and it's lost forever and that's that's absolutely just, that's happened absolutely. a lot there's so much and you know like a lot of people argue about quality too oh the good stuff stays and the bad stuff goes i don't know i think like it's it's worth especially when it's tiny when when you're talking roms or old movies or whatever in the grand scheme of things it's tiny so you know keeping it all online and accessible i think is a far better fate than what you were talking about there where it just it ends up in a bin because it wasn't profitable enough for someone to bother right that's pretty sad but there's loads of classical. Um, I learned this study in uh, going to this small class about classical music, and it was there was a constant talk about that about how a lot of the guys that were that, that are almost like dead now, who and and like the previous generation of these big bands from like the 50s and 60s that was real popular, big bands with a lot of horns and stuff. Whatever influenced them to make music. Like they were saying it no longer exists because it fell under this new copyright law. It was never preserved. And when they finally would find it, like there was finally like 30 years down the road, they were getting to where the, like we are, where we're trying to preserve all this stuff or like Artemio, you know, trying to preserve stuff before it disappears. They were too late and we'll, we'll eventually be too late for something. There will be something out there that will disappear. But I do. Um, I do worry a little bit about that, on, like and wrapping this right back around when it comes to CRTs, that experience, right? Like that, what, what does composite video on a CRT look like? Have we, have we taken enough photos? Have we looked through, you know, magnifying glasses and microscopes at, you know, the, the, um, you know, the grills and the, and the, the, you know the the trinitron patterns to make sure we know what that stuff looks like to make sure that that's captured because that's all part of it too right not just the thing not just the rom yeah you can dump a rom cool but the experience of of that on the medium that was that at the time and you know that that's for anything right any any art form you want to a, a bit like your friends with their they have to have this specific hay bale right like that's all part of it for them to trying to recreate a thing and it's difficult yeah. and now expensive <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh and I think we're going to be struggling. I mean, and, and like the the thing is here being an American, you're always like waiting for somebody to just drop a cease and desist or a lawsuit. It's just it's sick. But um that's why like you do realize the importance of even the internet archive cuz again, you look at it, it's one place and what if they do get shut down one day by somebody who gets a real, you know, hard on for this? And so it's kind of like it would be like the burning yeah, of the absolutely. library of Alexandria for us. You know, it'll be it'll be devastating. There's, there's a group here in Australia called so, Trove, um, um, and they hold uh, academic journals. And you, they've got a lot of data scientists that work for them. And you can through a public interface. Um, one of the other things I do in my work is is help data scientists and do big data processing and things like that. Um, and you can use things like Jupyter Notebooks and other sort of data science tools to analyze these uh, journals, and they do a good job of digitizing them and making sure the data inside them is uh, viable. And one of the people that works for Trove did a um, just like a, a number of articles thing. So it was just a graph of like how many articles per year. And pretty much, you know, you track along at like whatever, 1900, 1912, and it's kind of like really low. And then it sort of starts to pick up around 1930, 1940. And you get to about, I think it's 57 or something when like the Sonny Bono copyright law thing came in and it just stops dead, like boom, straight down. And they call that the copyright cliff of death, right? That's when the lawyers come knocking and everybody just stops. And so, you know, even, and that's, it's weird because there's more articles from 1940 than there are from 1960. And you, you don't think that would be a thing, but that's the case when it comes to academic journals because of copyright and because of copyright law. Uh, and like what you were saying, right? Where everything's litigious. So, yeah, real shame. Yeah. So then you're, you're thinking, well, what if somebody claims that I copied their thing in my article, right? Then you're going to, that's, that's what happens. And you have lawyers saying, I don't think we can let him release this article. And it's running into uh, stifling, you know, like you say, it's, it's obvious when you see a drop like that, where um, it's almost like, it's almost like that's one of those things that you could see as an elite power, power 
uh, position, person, or something, entity, and you're noticing this. Ma it's almost probably like the internet age, right? It's like it's like where Google and everything is just taken off, and then you're going to try to do something to kind of slow that down and get it back to the manageable level, and uh, you know, do a lot of things to stifle people from continuing to open up their ideas and share that by scaring them Absolutely. with like and that's you know that's why i'm thank i'm really thankful for archive.org and trove um and even like again i know it's really contentious but groups like redump like you know thank god for them if if they weren't around how much of stuff would be lost and you know you it's hard to get their stuff but you know someone in that group's got it right like there's some nerd in a basement with a computer that's 100 percent offline no network cables no <laughs> wi-fi no nothing it's just this giant nass full of like playstation 3 games or something and they're not going to release it until the <laughs> playstation 17's out and then they just do a dump out to archive.org right so so thank christ for those people yeah yeah <laughs> they're just waiting yeah yeah well, what do you think, yeah, Lewis? Yeah. Uh, we're at two hours, man. We're at two hours. Maybe <laughs> we'll wrap it up. It's all. It's late for Dan. We're well, middle of the day. I got stuff to yeah. do, and, and and Steve's just starting his day. I mean, Time it's only it's only eight o'clock here in the morning. He's good to go. Good to go. Yeah, Dan, well, it's gotten a bit cooler. I think the bad. temperature uh, dropped off here in uh, <laughs> surface of the sun. Land. Finally broke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. All right. Well, Dan, thanks very much for thanks taking for the time having me on. To, to speak yeah. to tonight, mate. It was a good conversation. Good to talk about other stuff besides retro. Really mass. fun. Thanks, good guys. Good talk, mate. Yeah, great talk. All right. Thanks. Let's stay on the line. I'll hit the stop here. Yeah. Stay on the line so we got the upload finished as well. But thank you, everyone, for listening. Hope you got. Hope you like two hours of our banter. We'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>